Hey everyone! Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, fun times ahead, right? Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Fun times right now. Yeah, I hear you clickety clacking away. What's going on over there? What are you typing? I'm just updating. It sounds like, important. I, I, I'm updating like typing the, that with a purpose. The, the YouTube thing. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, okay. Don't worry about. It. Mind your own beeswax, Mike. No. Sorry, I'm just making sure the boat runs smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. This is episode 84 of the Flat Out Fever podcast, and today we start with a very, very special podcast because we have a very, very special guest yet again. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It's gonna be really fun. Nicholas Latifi. So who that guy? Go. On. Who them? Who yeah. them? He's a race car driver. Duh. He's <laughs> <laughs> from Toronto, hometown. Ooh. Ooh, hometown like warrior that. yeah so, so i'll give you the the quick 60 second rundown yeah. i guess so uh, to, uh relatively late for a race car driver mm-hmm. but amazing 2009 to 12 doing some go-karting mm-hmm. 2012 moved up italian formula three racing 2013 toyota racing series and uh with carlin team did some british f3 and the fia euro f3 Drove through the, drove drove throughout the year. 2014 again, Euro F3, Carrera Cup, Formula Renault, GP2, a little bit, one or two races. 2015 Formula Renault 3.5, Carrera Cup again, and some more GP2 races. And 2016 became the first Canadian to run a full season with the Dams Racing Team in GP2. Ooh, nice! Starting to really make a mark in the racing world. And now, hmm. testing driver for the Renault Formula One team. Hmm. Now, this we uh, we actually f- uh, f- were following him uh, earlier, and when this announcement came out, we were very excited. Um, As Torontonians and Canadians and racing fans, absolutely. Yes. What better could you ask for? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, oh, I, th- I I think we have a, a uh, one of the comments right now is that it's uh, uh our. Our stream may not be up to par right now. If you're listening, if you're watching live, uh, don't worry. It should stabilize. It will stabilize. S- soon. Yeah, if that's how the internet works. It'll yeah. be okay. It'll, it'll, be it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, so, yeah, guys. So, this is a guy from Toronto. He started uh, well, his, his his path to F1. Uh, maybe he started it, like, later than a lot of other drivers. But I guess... Um, like- 12, 13 years old. Which, <laughs> well, I mean, you're still, so, yeah. He's still young enough. I think uh, I've driven go-karts Van Dorn, like four times in my life. So. Van Dorn also like uh, started right around the same age. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so he's, he's got a promising future ahead. He's uh, right now uh, 17th in the GP2, in the, in the GP2 standings. Mm-hmm. Um, he is, uh, he's had some great battles. He's had some great races uh, uh, getting into the points, I guess, uh, uh, in uh, Malaysia and a couple other places. Anyway, um, he's uh, uh, he's a full-on racing driver, and he's doing test work for Renault right now. Yeah. Now, he's there are currently only, like, small rumors about him going to Renault, but I don't think – I don't think uh, – it's not it, it's not quite his time just yet. The Renault seat is very contested. Probably not this year. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those seats are, as far as the silly season goes – Yeah. The, uh, the top of the the talks, I guess, is mm-hmm. Renault. Yeah, in between Renault and Force India, they dominate the market. Renault right? themselves have been talking a lot too, I guess. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah, they have. Well, yeah, they're a new team, but it's, you <laughs> have to, you have to. Yeah. Um. So yeah, he's uh uh will be calling him up uh in just uh, a few minutes. Just um, minute, yeah. But yeah, he's a local guy from Toronto. He's I guess well he's he's been living most of his time recently in in europe as you do there one of the things that like uh, um, during his interview uh, if you find like some of his interviews he does mention that right now in this day and age you pretty much have to live in europe if you want to have a credible uh f1 feeder series career back in the day you had to 
uh you like you could have you could have lived uh, you know you could have participated in the mi minor series in the states or elsewhere in the world but right now the way that it works mm -hmm. you pretty much have to be in europe and compete in europe it's like, uh, yeah the point system the way it was the way it is yeah well and you need you need a certain number of championship points in the feeder f1 series to get to f1 which is the ultimate goal of these drivers well, but it's it's also been like but, that by design. Uh, well, yeah. actually, yeah. no, sorry, it's it's not just been like that by design, uh, because of the point system. It's also happened that over the past twenty, thirty years, the competitive level in Europe has risen way above any anything that any of the rest of the world could throw. And back in the day, it yeah, used to be that there was Pan American racing, and I think it was like uh, the Atlantic series or whatever. Um, that racers in North America could compete on, and they were like they weren't. I mean, they weren't at the same level as like the the top feeder series for F one in 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 the in Europe, but they were like just right out there. But there, not anymore. There might be as many go kart racing tracks in a few countries in Europe as all of North America, and you know, there's there's like the the Florida's has the winter series for go for North American mm. kart racing and. There's there's a few tracks around North America, but the concentration and the number of people competing and kids that are interested, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's you gotta you gotta there. go race in Europe a little bit. Um, but yeah, anyway, he's uh, he's uh, he, we managed uh, to get him for a few minutes for you guys <laughs> today and and for us rather um, than rambling and rambling. Yeah. Just give him a call. We're we're, we're really <laughs> we're really excited about this. Uh, and uh, yeah, so should give him a ring. Let's talk to our local boy. This is a flat out fever podcast, by the way. I don't think we said that. <laughs> no, we have the said top. That. Uh, we did actually. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. I made sure. All right, Mike's on top of everything. Nicholas on TV. <laughs> Skype. Skype is amazing. Isn't it brilliant? It's 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 awesome. It's the future. It is the future. Is now. Let's just you know hope it goes through. Would you would you? This is hilarious. Would you like to leave a video message? You like to leave a, a message? It's like an answering machine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll just uh, we'll wait. Well, we'll, we'll give it a minute. My parents we'll used to have an answering machine that had two miniature audio cassettes in it. One of them was the recording that says, oh, we're not home right now. Yeah. Please leave your name message and we'll call you back whenever we we get home. And then the other, <laughs> and then the other one recorded and it would be like, <laughs> it made these crazy noises. It, it knew where all the messages were somehow on cassettes. Cassette That's tapes. On, yeah. On cassettes on no less. You know, like maybe message him and be like, yo. <clears throat> So how fun was F1 at Betty's this weekend? One of the few live races that we are allowed to, or not allowed, but able, I guess allowed because bars can't serve alcohol or open before 11. That's Otherwise true. we could have done a few more live ones this year, but yeah, one of the few live events that we, events that we, that we could uh, show this year Sorry. or watch, even watch. I Sorry, only saw I maybe stream health things. One second. Sorry guys, it seems like we're having some uh, some technical difficulties. Uh, please, internet's being lame. <laughs> yeah, that was maybe the third or fourth race that I've seen live the whole season. Montreal, we were there. Oh yeah, we were there. We were we were in person. This one, there were one or two. Uh, I could I couldn't even tell you which one. One or two, where I woke up at three, four, five in the morning and wa watch and watched them. Yeah, and watched them again at Betty's, but. No, that was fun. And thank you for everybody that did show up to Betty's uh, ah, this so weekend. Fun. We will be doing it, obviously, again for the Mexican Grand Prix. We do try to, like, do these, especially when they when they go live uh, on our time zone. Uh, just to give everybody an update. See, I was telling a buddy of mine about it. Like, you, sh you should show up. Like, like come, yeah, come out. Like, here, here's the time. Here's the date. Come out. And he's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know people there and stuff. But it's it's kind of like going to the movies, like. I don't know everyone that shows up. You don't know all the people that show up. <laughs> it's kind of like going to the movies, but like everyone really wants to see this movie. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all there for the same reason. People start cheering when stuff happens. The room starts going crazy cheering. Yeah, it's fun. 
how, how like are we doing, Mike? Mini stadium <laughs> atmosphere, almost like a movie. Sorry about that. Um, Adobe, uh, uh, Adobe Creative Cloud is like a really weird program that like it constantly clocks in. Yeah, yeah, yeah and so I yeah, left yeah. it on that computer. Oh, there we go. We're back in green. Yeah, should All be right. good to go. Other computers taking over the whole internet. Yeah. Screwing around. I'm gonna try and call him again. Yeah, let's give it a shot. Tell that other computer to relax. In the other over there in the living room. Hello. 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 Nicholas Latifi. Hey, yeah. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hey guys, how's everybody? Very well, thank you. How are I'm you? Doing great. How are you? Yeah, I'm all good. Thanks. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, perfect. Can, can you hear me? us? Yeah, I hear you guys. Wow, all. Actually, awesome. hang, okay. hang hang in there, Nicholas. I uh, I don't think the volume is like way up for for this. I mean, I can I can hear him only faintly. That might be your thing. You should be okay, fine. Yeah, it could be fine. Okay. Nicholas, uh, uh, I am Javier. Danny. And I'm Mike. And uh, we are the hosts of the Flat of Fear podcast, a uh, podcast based in uh, your hometown of Toronto. Thank you very, very much for giving us this opportunity to chat uh, and making a break in what must be a very busy schedule. Yeah, I have a bit of, uh, a bit of time off right now with you my last race. So, yeah, my pleasure to i on this podcast with you guys. Oh, that's awesome. Thank, Thank you very much. So cool. Yeah. Uh, so you Thank were you just much. recently in Austin, Texas. Yes. How was, was that? There, uh, yeah, so it was um, actually only the, the, the second Grand Prix I've been to when I've uh, not been racing myself this year. Obviously, mm. GP2 does does half the, the races with Formula 1. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was nice to have another opportunity. Uh, obviously, the other Grand Prix I went to was Canada. Canada? Uh, so it was nice to have an opportunity just to be, be in the background. Uh, just kind of like learn and observe, uh, you know, take part in all the, the, the let's say the, the pre-session briefings with the team, kind of get to figure out how they, how they, uh, let's say, set the program, all the debriefings, see how the drivers interact with the engineers and just work with the whole team because really it's, it's quite a bit different to uh, any other junior formula racing just with the sheer volume of people that <laughs> formula one drivers have to work with. Yeah. So it's, uh, interesting to see and it's actually surprising how much you learn just from you know being in the background 100 percent. actually i want to ask you about that uh mike can you pull up that picture i'm, I'm highlighting it right now on the book yeah um yeah we saw you out on the the track walk yeah so you were doing a track walk from like with one of our favorite drivers in formula one right now jolly and palmer how's J how's jay how's jay pal going on right now <laughs> how, how, how is he is he a fun guy to talk to or what what's going on there yeah, he's, he's a really nice guy, actually. Um, I've uh, e even before he was in Formula One, I had, uh, we're not necessarily like close, close uh, friends, but you know, I, I we we've known each other for uh, like I said, a, a few years. He also raced with the uh, the GP two team that I'm currently with. He won yes. the championship with them. Yeah. Uh, so I've seen him on a few separate occasions. Yeah, he, he's a really nice guy. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, I I, I really like him as a commentator. Um, but <laughs> here we're showing a picture. Uh, Mike, can he can he? See? Uh, I don't know oh, if yeah, you guys. Yeah. Yeah, so this picture right now, it shows you just off to the right there. And I, I just something that you said right now, like really is something that I, I, I've been curious because it must be one of the biggest uh, uh, shock factors, if anything, or like biggest cultural differences going from somewhere like GP2 or any of the junior formula to F1. And all of a sudden you're surrounded by so many people and everybody's watching what you do and you have to interact with so many more people than before. Um, I, like, was that crazy to even, to, like, you know, I, obviously you're there as part of one of these people that, that are effectively Julian Palmer's entourage in this picture. But um, like, like how was, how is that atmosphere? Like from a, from a driver's perspective, like you, you, you have your communications person, your PR person there. Uh, like, I, I, that must be that must get hectic yeah so obviously it's uh i guess if you're jumping straight into a to a race seat let's say from straight from a junior formula it can be a bit overwhelming with how many people so actually uh everyone wearing the yellow shirts except me is that are actually uh engineers on just jolian's car so kevin oh, magnus and the other driver oh, has, has his own set of uh engineers as well and then on top of that there's all the mechanics so and gp2 and in uh 
other junior formulas, Formula 3, Formula 0, 3.5, you, ma you mainly have two guys, two engineers that uh, you work with. You have your race engineer and your performance engineer. And F1, you see how many more engineers <laughs> there are, and they all have their own role. That's like their own job uh, for a specific part of the car. So, wow. you know, you, you do have your main race engineer, which is who the driver is, let's say, in contact with the most, but, but everybody will constantly be coming to you to ask certain things about the session, wanting your feedback. Uh, though be, throughout the session, they'll always be relaying information to the race engineer, uh, which he'll then relay back to Julian. Because when you're driving, you don't want 20 different people talking to you on the radio. You just want your <laughs> your, your one race engineer, and then uh, so all of the information will get funneled through him. Right. You but don't, yeah, you don't uh, want like a broken it, telephone. It's a bit overwhelming, I guess. Like, and and this is one of the reasons why I think it's good that um, you know I'm able that uh, I'm able to experience this now while I'm not in, let's say, in the race seat. Obviously, my goal is to get to Formula One. That's what I'm working towards. But uh, to experience this and at least be exposed to it while not having the the pressure of being in the race seat, I think is uh, right. something very good and beneficial. Now, that guy all the way off to the right, who looks like uh, fake Nico Rosberg, <laughs> <laughs> what, what's he doing? He looks like he's trying to block his face so you guys don't look at him. <laughs> Like, um, the picture is actually is not very clear, so if I, uh, I can't see the face, but if I have to guess, I think that's Julian's uh, that's Julian's friend okay, and so the uh, trainer. Oh, okay, people in the people with the black shirt are not officially part of the team, but they're part of the the weekend crew. <laughs> can you see it better now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but thankfully, it's still, it's still team kit, which is good. <laughs> just uh, just different color. <laughs> cool. Um, I, I have one of those black shirts too. I just chose not to wear it. <laughs> Renault is obviously right now a very interesting team because uh, their position right now in the Formula One pack. Let's, let's say somebody just got into F1 uh, with absolutely no 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 knowledge of motorsports before, and they look at where Renault is right now, and they're 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 further down than what their potential is. Let's put it right. that way because they are a manufacturer team. They make their own engines. They supply other teams with with engines. So it's a team that as far as anybody can tell they're just sort of in a rebuilding phase because they had they just committed back to f1 for the long term this year and then they've had to like work out some kinks and they're still clearly in that process but it's a team that has a long future which is why honestly when we found out that uh you signed with them as a test driver we covered it here on the podcast and we're very excited because we like we as 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 you do i'm sure uh, as well can tell that Renault is going places and mm -hmm. and as a as a long-term bet they they do seem like quite a reasonable bet um uh, nico hulkenberg just got signed with them do you like is is that the kind of environment that you saw at the team there while hanging out with them that is is everybody really just focusing on on a long term future and like really like they're thinking ahead to not not necessarily even next year but in two or three years time challenging for wins challenging for a championship? Yeah, for sure. I think that's the goal. Um, it was always going to be a, a transitional year for them this year. Obviously, they took over uh, the, the Lotus, Lotus team very late last year and pretty much started from the exact same car that Lotus ended off last year, which. No, wasn't uh, wasn't the most competitive. Um, mm -hmm. So they started, let's say, from uh, from last year's car with not really any development. And for sure, in the first part of the year, they were uh, bringing some developments. But for the most part, um, they switched quite early their focus to the 2017 car. Yeah. Obviously, in 2017. Uh, there's a very big uh, rule change for the cars, and the, the wider tires, the well, you know wider wings are going to be much quicker, probably around uh, four to five seconds a lap quicker, mm -hmm. uh, just off uh, mechanical and aero performance because the engines are regulations are pretty much the same. Uh, so it was always going to be a transitional year, and for sure, they're uh, uh, you know they're, they're a team that's going to have great potential because, like you said, they are a full manufacturer team now. They've been making en their engines for. A, uh, for a while, and now obviously, when you combine both the engine making and chassis making in house, for sure, uh, yeah, for, for sure, it's a big advantage. Yeah, absolutely. So, I guess you're you're in Austin all weekend, checking out the city, seeing the sights, enjoying the weather. I was I was a bit confused on the TV because like they kept saying how hot it was. It's really hot here. So many people wearing pants and jackets, <laughs> and also. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the weather was a bit strange in the, in the mornings. Or well, in the in the mornings, it was quite cold. Uh, and I, I, well, I, I, it was cold for me. I wanted to wear a jacket. <laughs> and then, yeah, soon, and I'm from Canada, so if I'm putting on a jacket, then I'm cold. <laughs> everybody, everybody else is uh, in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and also. Um, and, 
yeah, and then in the middle of the day, it just would just warm up, right? So, uh, yeah, it was a bit, bit strange, but uh, it, it, it wasn't too hot, actually. It wasn't too hot. The, Ideal conditions for drawing. About about Austin itself, I, I saw your uh, your your vlog that you posted of the down. Your, your hotel was downtown, right? Yep, downtown. So I hear all these uh, sayings like Austin is like the Tor- the the Toronto of America. It's America's <laughs> Toronto. It's a similar culture, that kind of stuff. But looking looking out your window there in your in your video, <laughs> I didn't really get that impression. No, definitely, I agree with you. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure who said that, but I don't agree with them. <laughs> no, I, you know what I think it is. I think I think they're talking about like just the amount of the population that's composed entirely of hipsters. <laughs> hipsters, yeah. <laughs> In, uh, independent uh, beers and barbecue. A lot of band spots, I guess. Uh, uh, that, that, that might be true. Yeah, honestly, I didn't get to. Um, uh, I didn't get to explore so so much downtown. Uh, like for the most part, they're like full days, uh, yeah. full days at the track. Um, obviously, I kept staying downtown. Yeah, went to right. a few different uh, restaurants to eat, most of which were steakhouses because <laughs> obviously, uh, and, and in Texas, that's really yeah. the the only thing you can go for, and you're, you're sure you're gonna get good quality. Yeah, you don't you don't steaks. go to Texas to get a salad. <laughs> no. <laughs> We're like, yeah, should we go for like a nice Italian? It's like, no, 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 no it's no, probably going to be average here. <laughs> You're in Texas, you got to eat steak. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. You're supposed to spend all your time at the track, right? Yeah, well. That's what you're there for. If if GP2 had a had a race in the States, like you would have otherwise been there driving yourself, obviously. Um, and, yes. And, and, but on the weekends when that does happen, and, and I don't know if everybody is familiar with this or not, but GP2 was basically a series that was designed from the get-go. After the fall of Formula 3000, uh, Bernie Ecclestone basically got uh, together with Flavio Briatore and they said, we gotta like streamline a further, like a way to get into Formula One. And they came up with the concept of GP2 and GP3 as as the, the, the premier the feeder, feeder series. series into F1 and 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 that's why they also go together so well as as a backup series during during the events mainly in Europe and sometimes in Middle East and Asia um but what is what is that like for you guys because you have uh in GP2 you have two races you have that the, the the sprint race and the feature race and that is all going on at the same time as the F1 cars are going around and 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 the whole circus is happening like what's what's that environment like, like I, I, are you guys when the uh, when the when the F1 guys are around like are you guys kind of treated like okay like here's the GP2 guys here's the F1 guys you know like, clean the podium real quick like hurry up with your GP2 podium ceremony here's the F1 guys coming <laughs> How is that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think one of the things that makes GP2 and GP3, let's say, attractive to drivers, uh, att- that, that makes drivers want to race in those championships is the fact that you're in the Formula One paddock. You're, you're under like the, the microscope of all the Formula One mm. teams, um, which is, and obviously the atmosphere of a, of a Formula One race weekend, right? You're, you're, you're in the show. Well, we're the support race to the show, yeah. but you're still uh, in the show. So, yeah, yeah it's, uh, um, you know, you, you definitely feel sometimes that, um, Sometimes the organization like will make it clear that you know you're not the show, and uh, just like, for example, <laughs> little things like uh, you know there's little delays in, in let's say certain sessions or like these rain delays yeah. um, for Formula One. You know they'll really like you know adjust the schedules, but like sometimes they could uh, you know cancel one of our races on one day and put it the next day or, or shorten a practice depending on if there's too many like in Malaysia for example we had 15 minutes less to practice just because of the, the scheduling I guess there was a bunch of other support races mm. which for me I didn't really uh, I didn't really like because I mean we're all we're going all the way to Malaysia we already don't get a lot of track time uh yeah, in in TP two, and they showed in the practice session by fifteen minutes, and we even drove a day earlier. So for me, it's like okay, we're going all this way, and you're taking practice away from us. But again, it's because Formula One is it, is the show, rightly so. Yeah. So uh, you, know, you, you definitely feel sometimes that you're <laughs> you're there to support them. But yeah, the whole atmosphere, I have to say, it's um, um you know compared to the other series I raced in, I I spent two uh, two years in the FIA Formula Three European Championship, and we obviously support many of the DTM races. And DTM is you know like, like the Formula One of uh, let's say GT racing, sedan racing, uh, which they get some races that can get just as many people there. So those weekends are cool as well. But Formula One, you just you really feel the that atmosphere and that vibe. And depending on uh, which races you go to, obviously we got we get to race at Monaco. 
that's you know just completely right. over yeah. the top. Uh, you know, uh, Abu Dhabi at the end of the year, I, I've raced there before in, in GP2. That's a crazy one too. We get to do a night race and pretty much any race where you're gonna get a bunch of fans. Yeah. Silverstone, the stands were packed, and again. For, uh, for us to race there in, in that environment, it's, uh, mm. it definitely makes a bit of a difference and it's something really cool to be a part of. You know, something that I found uh, <laughs> like funny and cool at the same time, uh, when uh, when it was the first time for everybody at Baku earlier this year. Oh, that's uh, I was just going to say the exact same yeah, thing. Yeah, so um, it, I, I found it funny that the F1 drivers were, were commenting over and over again how everybody was watching you guys because yeah. you guys were basically the next best thing to F1, but it was, the circuit was new to everybody. So everybody was watching like the kind of lines that you were, that you were taking, like, like how, how was that? How was hitting the, a brand new grade A certified FIA track before the F1 cars? And separately, because I think it got lost over that weekend through the broadcast and people are like, oh, Baku sucks, whatever. whatever. <laughs> how was it being there? Like, how was the city, the food, the people or whatever? Like, how, how was Baku? Yeah, okay, so I'll answer that question first. Um, so, yeah, obviously, um, Baku, it, it, it's a city that you could tell it's like, you know, the, the whole city is kind of being like modernized and like rebuilt. Like, there's really so old. many big buildings under construction. Mm -hmm. Um no, it, it was it was quite a nice city actually. Um, you know, weather was obviously nice. It was hot. Um, we were at least where the track was. It was close to the water, so that was nice. Uh, and you know the so from that regard, I I think it was quite okay. Uh, I I think we're going to be going back there next year in the GP2, so I'm nice. looking forward to that. Speaking about the the track itself, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So normally on a on a race weekend, uh, F1 will always drive one session before we drive, so they're kind of like the the track cleaners, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> Just, but, you know, most of the tracks are you know they're, they're proper racing circuits, so you know for Formula One they probably would have sweeped them down already. Obviously, Baku is a street track, yeah. and it's a brand Brand new street track, <laughs> so <laughs> it, obviously us having to do the first session there for them. We were the we were track cleaners, the first ones to drive and experience the track. <laughs> yeah, obviously it's uh, it, it was it was quite special. I know I always enjoy driving street tracks. I, I love street tracks. It's some of my favorite tracks uh, to drive. Um, but obviously when you're the, the first one, there's still like you know candy wrappers on the track, a lot of dust. <laughs> and, uh, it, it definitely makes it a bit more challenging, and especially when you're driving around and like dust is, rooster tails of dust are flicking off the car in front because uh, it, it hasn't been properly <laughs> sweeped. Uh, you know, it, it definitely changes uh, changes the game a bit. But, you know, the, the race, the track itself, um, you know, obviously it's get up to very high speeds, has the longest straight or the longest, let's say, uh, area where you're flat out because there are some corners on the straight, but you just take them flat out. Uh, and then to race, uh, well, yeah, I, I'm gonna, if you guys watch the GP2 races, and I think that those are the GP2 races that got kind of the most attention out of anyone this year, yeah. just because of the sheer carnage that happened. Yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was great to watch. <laughs> Cars going yeah. like almost uh, two stories high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't get to experience the first one because I got involved in a first corner accident. Uh, and, and, and yeah, in the first corner of the first race, so I think it's unfortunate that. But uh, I think yeah, only half the field finished that one. Yeah, and I was even gonna the say like I, I was like everybody got into that. an accident. That <laughs> yeah. Like li literally, if you just kept your nose clean and didn't, even if you weren't fast, even if you were one of the slowest cars on track, you kept your nose clean, you were gonna finish in the points in that first race because so many people like <laughs> fast in mistakes or got hit out or, and uh, yeah, it was just uh, it was a bit of a laundry that race, and especially with the long straight. You know, it was so difficult to, yeah. to pull away, especially with the DRS effect. And then we had the, all the shenanigans with the safety car restarts, oh, yeah. which created uh, really big accidents that uh, was really actually quite dangerous, especially the second uh, race that I was that I was in. Uh, you know, the, the front driver accelerating and then braking and then causing big pileups and stuff behind. That's uh, mm. on a street track. That's not something you really want to be no, <laughs> be a no part way. of, especially when you have nowhere to, to go. So that was a bit scary. But mm. uh, you know, I, I enjoyed the. Let's say I didn't enjoy. Uh, the end result because I didn't finish in the points in either race, but uh, <laughs> the experience was, was quite cool because I, I like racing on street tracks. Nice. Yeah. Cool. I got th the final question, I guess, in the same vein is uh, so Renault brought you to, to Canada to have the whole weekend experience there, but Canada for next season in F1 is one of the two races that's uh, not fully confirmed yet. Question mark, right? Because of the facilities and all that. Like, so. 
are the facilities really that bad? Like you, sp- you were in the pits. You, you probably walked through the paddock club and whatever. Yeah, what's, what's so bad about them? What's so bad about it? I know they don't have a real medical facility, and there's one or two things that could be spruced up. But or is it, is it really that, like, that bad? Or is it just that the buildings are from the '70s and they like everything to be? Yeah, is, is Bernie just uh, one of those just that snobby? <laughs> I, I think the main thing um, with Montreal compared to let's say the other F1 tracks is really just the space uh, the space in the paddock so like the garages are, are okay like you know when once the teams organize all their let's say their specific equipment you know you put, you, you put the camera in the Renault garage in Montreal and you put the camera in the Renault garage in any other track it's most likely going to look the same with the exception of Monaco that you're really limited on space yeah. but mm-hmm. I, I think the main thing is the, the actual paddock behind where there's really not a lot of room and also like the the, the space for the hospitalities, so like the hospitalities, for the team hospitalities, right. not the paddock club and that stuff. The team hospitalities are, are the smallest out of any track in, in Montreal just because there's literally, like, there's no space. Obviously, you have that uh, that, that waterway that runs just behind the, the paddock, and I'm right. pretty sure they were supposed to ex- expand the paddock into that waterway to oh create much more room. And, you know, from, let's say, having, uh, from being able to experience other paddocks, for sure, I think it's something that they, they should uh, they should address making the paddock bigger. I don't see it as a reason to to not go back there because Montreal is one of the best Grand Prix on the yeah. uh, on the calendar. Yeah, I know on, many baby. drivers w- love the track, and I know many drivers that's one of their favorite Grand Prix to go to just because of the atmosphere there. You know, it's right downtown, yeah. which you don't get with a lot of tracks. A lot of tracks you got to drive, you know, an hour and a half, two hours into the middle of nowhere yeah. and into <laughs> uh, the farmland, which uh, you know it, it, it's not. It, it sounds nice from the outside that you get to say, oh, yeah, I'm uh, going to go race in England, but you're not racing in London. You're racing no, in yeah. Silverstone, which is uh, <laughs> quite a bit in the middle of nowhere. So uh, a lot of times it can sound much nicer than it actually is, but Montreal is one of those races where you're, you're in this, the, the, the heart of the city, which is nice, and you get you know tons of passionate motor racing fans. I think it was like one of the only Grand Prix that I, I saw that on the Friday practice days that some of the grandstands were completely full. Yeah. Mm. So I hope... Uh, the Grand Prix goes back there. I definitely don't want to see that removed, not just because I'm Canadian, but yeah. because I think it really is one of the best Grand Prix on the calendar. It is, yeah. of course. It's a, of it's course. a lot of fun. Oh, actually, so you you just mentioned something about DRS, and correct me if I'm wrong, but DRS only made it to GP2 this year, right? Uh, no, last year. Oh, last well. year. Last year, yes. W- were you there to like witness the change? Like, how much? Like, how different was that? Like, now driving with DRS versus not DRS. So honestly, uh, in terms of lap time, uh, you know, the DRS will probably give you around maybe half a second hmm. advantage c- compared to non-DRS to DRS lap times. Um, you know, obviously we only use it in, in the straights, so it's not something that uh, you know you really have to get hmm. get used to. You're just approaching some corners with a bit of a higher top speed. The main thing that I feel has changed uh, is there is the okay. Obviously, it's made it easier to overtake. Hmm. So for sure. Uh, you know the racing aspect is a bit different in terms of strategy, but the one thing that I find uh, uh, it, it changes a bit in the way you have to manage the races because obviously when you're within the second gap of the car in front, you have the DRS, and in GP2 the DRS is quite uh, quite a big advantage. You know all the engines are the same, so you don't have the difference between like an F1 between the Ferrari, Mercedes, Renault, Honda engine. Where sometimes you can see, you know, if the Honda gets the DRS. It's, it's not going to make such a big difference to a Mercedes power car or, uh, you know, you see that sometimes in the Formula One races. So all our engines are the same. So it really, and it really has a, a quite a big effect because without it, it was, you know, quite difficult to overtake unless, um, you know, someone's tires massively dropped off in, uh, in performance. So the way you have to manage the races now is completely different because it's so effective. Most likely, if you are quicker than the car in front, even a few tenths, most likely you will pass them. Where in the past, you have to have like be like a second quicker than the guy to even have a chance of passing just because you know, it's so difficult to pass with, with these kind of uh, formula cars. So the way you manage the race right from the get-go is different because you really have to push much more than you did in the past around the whole track because without the DRS before you were able to you know save your tires and like let's say infield sections and just make sure you get a good exit out of the, the corner that leads onto the straight now you can't do that because if the guy's close onto that last corner onto the straight even if you get a good exit he's going to pass you down the straight because he has the benefit of DRS. Oh, so you have to push to try and maintain that gap the whole track and the way you manage the tires now becomes much more difficult because you're forced to push much more <laughs> yeah no doubt <laughs> that, that, that's that, that, that's pretty interesting and i guess that's why drs when it made it to f1 and it, it got some criticism people accused it of you know being artificial 
but it the result the end result from I guess from a from a viewer's point of view is that it, it has increased overtaking so I can see. Do you remember the first year though when DRS first came to F1, the first year, they were allowed to use it in qualifying anywhere on the track. Yeah, that was Cars insane. were fishtailing all over the place <laughs> and drivers were almost in tears about how scary it was, but they had to do it to compete. Yeah. That was amazing. Oh. I say go yeah, back. I remember like some some tracks they would be, get flat out corners like without the DRS, but then as soon as you put the DRS, they become a bit borderline. Yeah, yeah. And I was I, I got to experience let's say <clears throat> that kind of driving when I did the Formula Renault 3.5 oh, because yeah. they have a DRS system as well. Uh, not nearly as efficient as effective as GP2 and uh, the F1 because the the way it actually like let's say works is it doesn't flip the rear flap up it just kind of closes the gap between the upper element and lower element no. which just speaking simply it just stalls the wing so right. it, it, it just stops working the wing as well as it should um so it wouldn't make as big a difference but you definitely feel it and in that series too we were allowed to use, use in practice anyway. qualifying the, the drs wherever you wanted so as soon as you, <laughs> you were full throttle wheel was straight even if you're turning a bit still, you're putting the DRS on. Even some corners, like for example, uh, in Spa or Rouge, you're going flat out oh. there with the DRS. With the DRS. Whoa! <laughs> That's scary. That sounds amazing. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, uh, I, the first corner, you're flat out with the DRS. So it's uh, it becomes a bit sketchy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've tried it on the video game. It's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Even just digitally. Um, going back to, to Austin and I guess your role at Renault as a test driver, um i guess from like from from a from an outside perspective like we know that you guys do i guess some 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 in-car testing uh we saw that you went to uh, somewhere in belgium and 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 whipped out one of the v8s uh and yeah. i guess yeah actually first how like how loud are those things man they're awesome <laughs> Yeah, no, they're they're amazing. It's uh, obviously I, I haven't driven one of the hybrid cars, so um, you know, the, the fact that the car I did drive was the, was the V8 was was quite nice. Obviously, specifically speaking about Spa, you know, that's one of the reasons we we brought that car was because you know we know that's what the fans like. Yeah, uh, and, and you know the proper test days that I have done with the team, they've been in that car, so for sure it's it's something nice to drive, and, um, and it's you know more similar to to the GP2 car because now the GP2 cars are louder than than, than the, the F1, F1, yeah. one cars. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. But yeah, so on top of, of top of that kind of stuff and like maybe some simulator work, like what kind of like you know like just just to give a, a glimpse to, to to the fans, like what is what does it consist of? Like the job of being a test driver, like do you, do do you go to Enstone at Enstone Enstone a lot? Um, so yeah, the, the role is uh, is mainly to help with with my development. So mm -hmm. um, like I said, I haven't driven the actual uh, current year car yeah. because obviously you can't just test the car whenever you want. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the the only um, you, if you want to do a test day in a car like I've done, you have to take uh, take a car that's two years older than the current year. Uh, so we chose to do the test days in the 2012 car. So technically, I could drive be driving a 2014 car, which wasn't a great car for for the Lotus. I have a lot of problems, but uh, we we chose to do it in the 2012 car. So I had done a few test days in that. So that was a big part um, of the role to help with my development and also to give me more track time and parts, let's say, in, in the season where uh, there's big breaks in the GP2 calendar. Like, for example, in Mon in between Monza and Malaysia, I did a test day in that, which was good because it was a month break with, with no driving. And that's not such a, such a good thing, especially in GP2 when you're already limited and don't have a lot of track time. Besides that, um, yeah, I've spent some time uh, at Enstone. Uh, especially at the beginning of the year, I have another uh, session coming up uh, for some simulator, um, and that's just you know helping the team a bit with anything they, they want to test. Most of the time on the simulator, they'll be doing a lot of let's say correlation mm. um, running, which basically they'll they'll try something and the, uh, they'll have something they try on the car in real life, whether it's a setup change or uh, or, or a new suspension system, what, what have you, and then they'll try it on the simulator and they want to make sure they kind of get similar data, similar readings because if you do that, then you know you know the correlation is good and you, you have more confidence to test things on the simulator and know that it's what result it's going to have on the real car. So that's something quite important. Um, and then also, yeah, like I did in Austin, like I did in Montreal, I've gotten to go to a few races and it's just an opportunity for me to learn. Uh, yeah, learn and be in the background and see how you know a Formula One team operates, what's expected of the drivers, how they interact with the engineers, uh, and vice versa. Because again, it really is you know I, I said it before, but it really is a completely different world yeah. to uh, to GP2. So again, all, all these things just to help, let's say, further my development is 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 the main let's say uh, thing that comes with my test driver role. That's really exciting. I just wanted to say like that, it's really exciting for you, obviously, right? 
Because I, I feel like when people think of testing, it's like one of these things like, oh, no, you're testing new equipment or like new specs for a car or something like that. But to me, I guess someone who's new to Formula One in the whole world that it is, uh, I think that's really exciting. Sorry. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> exciting. And yeah, it's a it's a good opportunity for me. Uh, I know you said at the beginning of the the podcast that, you know, it's a, it's a full manufacturer team and it's a mm-hmm. team that has you know a lot of racing uh, pedigree and you know has a great history in the sport so to be um not only just with a, a formula one team but a formula one team like renault that has this history for sure is right. uh, is something quite special as well uh, on, on that same line like we always hear a lot of questions for for drivers and stuff like what's your physical regimen like what, what are you eating in the at night like how far do you have to jog how much weight can you lift <laughs> all that kind of stuff but I want to know about the mental training. Like, do you do like the two-handed yo-yos? You practice juggling. Can you ride a unicycle? Do you do any like kind of ba- like balancing practice or like reaction times? So, how, how do you practice? So I don't know how to juggle. Uh, I've tried juggling many times. I don't know how to juggle. I don't know how to ride a unicycle. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, there, there obviously is an aspect to the mental side of things. Um, you know, okay, the, the, the obviously the, I would say the physical aspect is always something that's um, underrated let's say from fans and, and spectators you know it is very physical to drive especially the cardio you know, for sure speaking sure. about our cars the gp2 we don't have power steering which makes it which is the one thing that makes it let's say if anything a little bit more difficult than formula one obviously our races aren't as long we don't have as high g-forces um, but we don't have power steering so that's as something quite uh, difficult but speaking about the mental side um yeah for, for sure i i think the one of the main reasons why you have to do some mental training as well, and this could be, you know, uh, you know, mental exercises or like little like cognitive games that you know you you could do like computer games or depending on um, you know where I, I used to train in the first half of the year um, in the Pyrenees Mountains. There was a trainer I was working with, and he had a center up uh, up there, and there was many many tools we used. Uh, some are some are secrets, so I can't mention. <laughs> uh, but m- m- many tools to you know train your, your you know your focus uh, over long periods of time, your concentration. Obviously, reaction is a big thing. You know, there's many of those. Let's say uh, reaction light systems where you know you're just hitting lights as quick as you mm-hmm. can, and just trying to in- incorporate a bunch of different things. You know, multitasking, memory, while you're still uh, taking part in. And let's say physical exercise and, and stressing yourself physically because you know that's what racing is. You know you're you're exerting yourself physically because you're driving. But there's many other things you have to manage at the same time while not hindering your your driving performance. And obviously that becomes more crucial in Formula One, especially when you see one of the steering wheels they have to work with oh that God. comes with like a, <laughs> a 300 page manual. <laughs> when you see the steering wheel, that's that's one of the things that always. Uh, intrigues most of the fans and spectators especially when they get to see one up close they're like is that really the steering wheel like this looks like a, like a video game controller <laughs> uh, so uh so yeah for, for sure it becomes uh much more important uh, when you're in formula one but it already is very important now and especially that again we, we can't drive as much as uh, as much as we like that's the one uh, let's say downside to uh to motor racing and especially motor racing at a very high level is the one way you improve anything, whether it's a sport, a skill you want to do, is you mm-hmm. practice, right? The only way you can improve something is if you practice it. This is the one sport where practice is limited and restricted, which is unfortunate. So because of that, it becomes that much more important to be mentally sharp and um, you know, do things that even if it's not actual driving, uh, can help you stay sharp and, and ready that when you do jump back in the car, it's as close as you, as you can to, let's say, not have ever been out of a car. Like for example, I just went uh, uh, this morning. I went karting. I have a KZ shifter cart. Uh, I went karting this morning just to, to stay sharp here in Toronto. A bit cold. Uh, I'll, actually, I went up to, to Innisville. So oh, yeah. oh nice, a, a bit, right on. A, a, a bit cold, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I gotta have a big break in between the the schedule, so uh, you know, just something to try and like, if, keep if the race. If you didn't know, sharp. Centennial Park's got Tooney laps on Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you've been there before. <laughs> Um, so you so you're back in town now. Is that, so uh, I, I guess it, it must be hard for you because to compete in Europe all the time. Like, um, you, like, so you probably have like a base in Europe that you spend most of the actual year at, right? Yeah. So I have a place in the, in the UK in Battersea, so where they have the Formula E race. It's quite close to the center of London. Um, honestly, this year I haven't spent so much time there. Reason being is because you know the team I race for is based in France in, in the Mans, oh, yeah. where they have the 24-hour race. Uh, so before each 
East race. I'm obviously spending time there. You know, in the summertime, Damn. when the, it was the European F1 races, they were all crammed into a very short amount of time. So it was a lot of back and forth between races uh, and and the team shop. Mm-hmm. Um, where I was doing my training in the first half of the year was also in France, in the Pyrenees Mountains. Um, and when I when there is a really big break in the schedule, like there is now, I like to come come home because I prefer to be uh, on this side of the pond <laughs> than, yeah. uh, than, uh, than over in, in Europe. Um, so and in the previous years, I did race for a British team, so that's one of the reasons why I had a place mm. in the UK. But it still is my European base. Uh, but yeah, I definitely like to to come home uh, as much as possible. So out, outside of family and, all, and uh, you know, the other obvious stuff, like like what, what what's another thing that you miss about Canada when you're out there? Um, the, the main thing that when I come back to Canada is I just try and like, um, just try to live like, let's say more of like a, I'm not, I'm not gonna say a normal life, but do <laughs> things that, I, that, that let's say I, I can't really do when I'm, you know, over there, mm-hmm. uh, like like just getting together with friends, going out on the weekends if I'm not racing. Obviously, I still stick to a very rigorous uh, training program, physical training program, and like I said, I do try and uh, keep active with driving various things, whether it's some simulator driving, go karting, things like that. One of the things I also miss too, uh, thankfully, this sport is played in the winter, and that's when I'm home the most. <laughs> is my basketball. I love my basketball. I love my NBA. Oh, nice. I love going to nice. the games. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, this when when the playoff start is normally when the season st- uh, the racing season starts and picks back up. So yeah. I always end up missing uh, the most exciting part. <laughs> Huge basketball fan. Uh, love to go to as many games as possible. Oh, so you you must be excited because the Raps are actually doing so great. Finally right? doing well. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm not going to the season opener tomorrow, unfortunately, but I'm going to be at Friday's. Uh, Cavs game, which I'm looking forward to, That's and I'm sweet. unfortunately I'm not here for the Golden State Warriors game. So again, just a sacrifice I gotta do with my racing. I'm not gonna be <laughs> here, so missing that game. <laughs> going going back to the the racing a little bit, something I've always wondered. You answered the, or you mentioned this like an answer or two back about the power steering. So if you could like for the listeners or for, for myself, compare the power steering. You don't have any power steering in GP2. Formula One has power steering. Mm. So I've driven before a, like a Honda Civic with the power steering disconnected. And on the opposite end of the scale, like I've played like a video game steering wheel with no power steering. So where would you rank like an F1 car? Because you can see on video, F- the F1 drivers get some kind of feedback through the wheel. Mm. Like there's some kind yeah. of force there, but is it close to zero? How heavy is the wheel, and how heavy is the GP2 wheel? Okay, so speaking about a, a Formula One car, yeah, obviously this, the power steering, so it's electronically a bit assisted. Um, yeah. You can, um, exactly. well, some teams at least, I know, you, um, they they play around with that because you do want some resistance you want, in the yeah. wheel. You don't, you don't want that. It's like you know, you could just like turn it with one finger and like blow on the wheel and it's going to turn. Because obviously, the main thing you lose with that is the feeling of the car. Because you know, when you play, let's say, uh, video games, if you just use a simulator. Uh, sorry, a simple, you know, Logitech steering wheel or a- any kind of basic wheel you get to play uh, PlayStation or iRacing, Xbox game, something like that. Yeah. You know, the, the main way you feel the car is the vibration through the steering wheel. Right. Uh, it's really the only way you can feel the car, and that obviously in real life too plays uh, plays a big part in how you feel the car and how you react in correct snaps of oversteer and things like that. Obviously, we feel the car through our butts, through our uh, <laughs> that are like pretty much sitting on the, the floor of the car. So you feel yeah. like that too. But when that's one of the things that you that you lose, let that let's say it's a sensation that you lose when you go from a non-power steering to a, a power steering car is uh, that let's say that, that feeling and knowing ex- exactly what when the car is going to snap. You do kind of feel it, but it takes a bit more time to get used to. And that's for me is one of the biggest differences in stepping from the GP2 to the <clears throat> to the F1 car. Now with a GP2, obviously. You know, we don't have the power steering. The wheel gets very, very heavy. So, you know, I, I'm sure uh, when you drove your, I think you said it was the Honda Civic without the power steering. I'm sure you were still able to turn the wheel, but I'm yeah. sure it was like very, very heavy, and it's not something comfortable you, to drive with. When you pull uh, into a parking you, spot, it's pretty heavy. It's like 15 pounds, and like a really good yeah. one of the really good Logitech wheels will give you eight or nine pounds. So, how do you compare a GP2 wheel to that? So it, it would be much much heavier. So, yeah. so in, in terms of uh, okay, actual weight, I I, know, I probably wouldn't be able to give you an, an example. But the the one thing is, you know, the the weight of the wheel will obviously change depending on the kind of how, corner you're going through. Because in a slow speed going. corner, you have no aerodynamic load on the car, 
So the wheel is still heavy, but it's, let's say, as light as it's going to get. Whereas when you go through a high-speed corner, when the, the aerodynamics of the car are making thousands of pounds of downforce that are pressing the car into the ground, the tires are getting forced into the ground, and you're having to turn that. So in that, the, the faster corner you go through, the much heavier the wheel gets, especially when you, if you add elevation change, let's say, like Eau Rouge, when you hit the compression mm. in, in spa and you're going up the hill, it's a flat-out corner. Very very steep uphill. The wheel is probably the heaviest there out of any other track that uh, that we drive. And you know, over an hour long race, it's uh, it becomes uh, quite challenging. Sounds amazing. You're giving me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Oh, hey, anyway, man. Uh, I jeez. Uh, all, all of a sudden, I just looked, and we've taken up a lot of your time. And and thanks for staying with us. I know that when right. we talk. <laughs> Yeah, when we talk to your guys, I guess we 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 really only uh, committed to half an hour, but it's been past that. Well, I, I, I guess one thing that I did um, want to ask you is now looking forward to the rest of the year, uh, you have one more race coming up, and like you mentioned before, that's that's gonna be at the at, it's both seasons, the F1 season and and the GP2 season are gonna end up at the same time. We're pretty much heading towards one of the most contested. Uh, championships in Formula One. It might not get decided till then. Uh, you're gonna be there. It's gonna be a great party. But you're also gonna have to to to, to show something because it's gonna be the last race. Uh, are you excited? What are your thoughts going into that race? Like, what are you looking forward to? So yeah, obviously, I'm very much looking forward to the last race. It's at a track that I really like, and um, it's one of the best Grand Prix. Let's say in terms of the atmosphere you get to as well. You know, we get to race at night there, which also adds a different element to it but yeah definitely looking forward to the end of the season um you know for sure it's been uh, let's say the season didn't go the way i expected mm. i'd be lying if i said uh, uh I, I was happy with the way it gone i definitely had some higher expectations but uh i think the main thing with you know the last race of any championship really is you always want to end on a high because and then obviously you go into a long winter break and most likely our first race won't be until middle of april <clears throat> next year so that's a that's a long break especially if you end on a let's say a, a sour note so definitely want to want to keep let's say uh making uh, making steps forward in my learning and development because uh, you know in gp2 you learn something new every race you're constantly getting more experience so really looking forward to that uh in terms of the f1 yeah like you said i agree i really think the championship is going to go down to the last race i hope it does i hope <laughs> so yeah oh man hey, hey. you don't like to see the championship get decided a few races before the end because no. then it kind of takes away the, the a bit of the excitement in the closing races. For so sure. I, I, I'm hoping for that, uh, you know, and uh, you know, in, in that regard, I'm let's say just as much a uh, a motor racing fan and just <laughs> I, I, I want the same thing as any other normal spectator because you know <laughs> I, I'm not racing. I, I want an exciting battle down to the end. I want to be on the edge of my seat too. Being like, oh my god, like who, who's gonna win this? And then obviously it's something that, uh, you know, uh, always when I see, uh, let's say the the champion crowned at the end of the the year, or maybe it's not at the end of the year, maybe it's during a race. You know, it's something that you know gives me more motivation because obviously that's what I'm working towards. That's what uh, that's what my dream is, and that's what I've dedicated a good chunk of my my life to. So that's uh, also something I'm looking forward to to see the the celebrations. Cool. Uh, actually, well, uh, quick question. So you when you were at Uh, racing at the same time that f1 is racing and then whatever you get um you, you finish your race and, and and you go somewhere like like what what do you do like where do you hang out to like actually watch the f1 races like with the so with your uh badge as a competitor like do they give you like pretty much the same access as anybody else can you just pretty much go anywhere and watch the race um no so actually with our uh let's say gp2 passes uh, you know our paddock passes are different It's not the same paddock uh, as the Formula One, so it's oh. different area. So actually, we can't. Our passes don't allow us to go in the grandstands and anything because that's a separate ticket, like a ticket like a normal spectator would buy. Yeah. So actually, uh, a lot of times it happens where if we want to watch the race and we just have our GP2 paddock pass, you're at the track, but you're literally just watching the race on TV in the GP2 hospitality. Oh yeah. So more often, um, and, I, and I've done it before. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's not <laughs> such a good thing, let's say, to to admit this or say this, but you know. Sometimes the races are better to watch on TV because you you hear the commentary oh, yeah. oh, yeah. and, and, and you see everything, right? So as much as, as nice as it is to, to you know actually see the cars going around, especially if you know, okay, you know, if it's your first Formula One race. Yeah, I've seen the yeah. cars going around many times, and, and in all honesty, as a fan, sometimes I prefer to watch it on TV because you get to see yeah. more the whole race and understand what's going on. So right. one of the times, 
uh, if I'm not flying out of the race Sunday night, which I won't be uh, in Abu Dhabi, I'm probably going to go back to my hotel and watch the race on the TV there. <laughs> <laughs> That's sweet. <laughs> I was, I was just my gonna... hotel is going to be right across from the tracks, like a two-minute walk. So it's not like I'm <laughs> just saying, okay, I'm done with my day. I don't care about Formula One. Let's go. I'm, I'm still going to be able to hear the cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was just going to ask, but I guess you said it. You're going to be in Abu Dhabi, right? Yes, I'm going to be uh, so, be in Abu Dhabi, and then obviously um, you know, our, our postseason testing uh, takes place the week after the race, so uh, so I will be staying uh, for another week so after y- the you race. You mentioned like, ob- uh, obviously you don't get to drive the current year's car during the season because they need it for races and stuff, but what do you think about the idea of post-Abu Dhabi, all test and development drivers race in Abu Dhabi <laughs> with the current spec it, car it, it, with the current spec car yeah the drive the F1 drivers get out at the podium ceremony whatever whatever <laughs> immediate second race with the test and development drivers current cars I, I think we need to uh, propose that idea to Bernie <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's call him up after the show <laughs> number. Where do I s- to send the idea over <laughs> <laughs> I'm off man. <laughs> I will be the dream, man. That's that's why you guys like start even to get into this path, this this crazy path that it obviously takes uh, uh, a certain amount of uh, of well, a huge amount of life dedication, commitment, a huge amount of yeah. Like I, we honestly, every time that we interview a driver, um, it, it's just astonishing to see to see like the commitment that you guys have, and obviously you have to have it these mm-hmm. days. Um, but it, there's, as far as I can tell. In terms of having like a normal life, you guys don't have much time for that. And and just just like you said that you you, you come to Toronto, you just try to do normal people stuff because your life outside of it is just so the opposite of that, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> um, it, I I guess another thing is uh so after this year is done, uh, you're looking to go back to uh, to GP two keep uh, I guess working on some skills and then hopefully look forward to a future in F1 by then I'm sure Renault would have uh, if anything like you know especially with with the fact that we're not gonna have any more tokens next year we, we everybody's expecting to see a very competitive Renault the seats that do become mm-hmm. available when they become available are gonna be highly contested so what would you have to say to say uh, to uh, uh, a guy like Freddie Vasseur He's thinking of looking to pick up some some new drivers coming up, uh, you know, in a couple of years' time. He, he he knows you, but he but there's other people knocking on his door. What would you say to making sure that you're the guy that makes it to F1 instead of somebody else? Honestly, uh, a lot of what's going to determine my my future. And okay, so like you said, first of all, I will be doing another year of uh, GP2, um, most likely staying with the same team. Um, but a lot of what's going to determine my future after that, especially my future in F1, hopefully if I have one, is going to be my results next year. So let's say the the talking I, I would do to, to Mr. Basser would be, you know, the best talking would be to get the results on the track because that's what they're going to be looking at. He's Absolutely. told me that's what they're going to be uh, looking at. And it's, you know, it's most of the time the same with any uh, with any Formula One team, not just with Renault, with Red Bull, Ferrari, uh, Mercedes. You know, you got to get the results on track. So, you know, next year is going to be my second full year in the in the championship. Obviously, you have much higher expectations than, uh, than this year. And, you know, all, all, Always the second year around, for, uh, you know, you see drivers always have much stronger years, especially in a championship like GP2. Um, so yeah, obviously there's uh, there's a bit of musical chairs, let's say, within the Formula <laughs> One world right now, um, which which I which I think is good. It's nice to see change. It's, it's nice to see um, you know drivers going to different teams, so current drivers going to different teams, new drivers entering Formula One, which which is nice. Uh, keep things fresh and you know not you know obviously the top teams will always most of the times. Sign their their drivers for like long term contracts, three three year deals. So I, I think that's good for for the excitement of Formula One and also for junior drivers like myself trying to get into the sport because you know it gives you let's say uh, it creates opportunities if you know there's always you know drivers getting signed to one year contracts and it really puts the pressure on everyone to try and be at their best and perform at their best whether you're in GP2 any other category or in Formula One because you know your seat can always constantly be at risk because there's always going to be somebody coming through that's going to be working just as hard if not harder to try and kick you out of your seat and then show them what they're capable of. Yeah. Jeez. That's what silly season is all about. <laughs> what do you got? So, 
So I guess uh, we saw you with uh, Tim Moraney last week. Oh, yeah. Doing a, doing a little... A couple weeks back. Two weeks yeah. back, I guess. <laughs> doing a little drive around interview. And it's, it looks like Infinity is giving you the keys to one of those. Yeah, so they gave, me, how uh, it is. That they gave me the keys to a the blue Q50 Red Sport 400. Red so Sport I've been enjoying my time driving so far because I like... actually didn't have a car here before then. So. Oh. <laughs> Did they give you that for F1 practice? It looks like it basically has the Renault F1 tech almost <laughs> built, it, built in. <laughs> yeah, like it's actually surprising. It, it's a very nice car to drive. Surprisingly very fast, honestly. Yeah, I was okay. It has a twin turbo, 400 horsepower, and I was really surprised at how fast. Like once the turbo kicks in, you know, it's really, really powerful, which is quite nice. And yeah, the technology in the in the car is is also, uh, you know, I, I like that kind of stuff. I like the high tech kind of gadgets yeah, in the car. So, nice. you know, I, I'm more for that. But you know, the main thing is I'm not carless anymore, which is yeah. which is great. <laughs> no, no more TTC. <laughs> no more. It looks like almost like. Uh... Like a step, one step away from a concept <laughs> car. But I was looking at like the Infinity videos yesterday. They're doing some testing and stuff at the at the Nordschleife, at the Green Hell. Have you ever gotten to driven there? To drive there? No, so I've never driven the Nordschleife. Um, I've driven in, in Nurburgring, so the Formula One track, but never around like the the full full Nordschleife. Sorry, That's something definitely I uh, I want to do. But before I do that, I would kind of want to have the track memorized because uh, it can become a bit sketchy going <laughs> like, around there. That's what Gran Turismo is for. Boy. <laughs> uh, it's amazing it's amazing cool um all right man yeah I, I think we've 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 successfully wasted enough of your time <laughs> already um uh we're gonna let you go but before we let you go um thank you again so much uh for uh, for giving us the opportunity to talk um maybe we can say that uh, we'll catch up with you sometime in the future for sure, yeah, it'll be my pleasure. I enjoyed talking to you guys. How about how about we say and 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 just just to put a little bit of pressure now, we got Lance Stroll to agree to this as well. How about we say we'll see you in Montreal next year for a couple beers? For How's beer? that? That uh, sounds good. One or two beers? If I can make it out to Montreal, I'd love to be there. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks sounds so good, much. Man. Th uh, a huge a lot. pleasure again for everybody. This is Nicholas Latifi uh, driving for Dams GP2 and uh, Renault F1. Uh, test driver and yeah, proud Canadian and all around great guy. Nikki Lutz. Thanks so much, man. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. See ya. Have Thank you. Good luck. Cheers. Have a good afternoon. Cool. Uh, I guess we're going to take a quick three, four minute break here. I'm going to about to pee my pants. Yeah. And we'll yeah. come back with the, uh, the Austin race review, the Mexican race preview. And we're gonna chug the some regular, bullshit. Well, we're not gonna chug him. We're just gonna drink him. Regular we're gonna drink, we're news gonna drink and some. Oh, sorry. Oh, some uh, some down some, some down downforce. Downforce. Yeah, downforce. Yeah, some downforce. That's why you got that. Yeah, downforce yeah, yeah. power. Okay. Some downforce. All right, guys. Yeah, we'll be back in a few minutes. Some downforce. 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 <clears throat> Thank you again live, to are we, are yeah, we on yeah. the internet now. Oh, we're we're here. Yeah. 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 Thanks again to Nicholas Latifi for giving the opportunity to talk to him. He was. Fucking what a cool cat, man! Yeah. Thanks again to America, America. especially Texas. Well, America. Well, don't forget freedom. freedom. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Thank you, freedom. Yeah, we need, we need freedom. Thank you, Austin. For what? <clears throat> exactly, exactly. Just out of curiosity, maybe I'm missing. Something. For being close by, part of the the namesake of the event. <laughs> I don't know. Bald eagles. Can't forget about those guys. Oh, Listen. Shit. Yeah. Free range steak. <laughs> it, it wasn't as great a race though. Mm, no. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of boring. You know a lot, lot I mean. of dropouts. <laughs> it wasn't as great a race, uh, and uh, obviously, like part of it was uh, there was no typhoon. Well, <laughs> that would have been exciting. A typhoon could have uh, spiced things up, right? Especially Absolutely. with the way more people than <laughs> was ever expected. They would have all got so wet. Oh man! Next time, um, how cool was the T Rex? The T Rex. <laughs> yeah, but obviously losing um, Max Verstappen. Yeah, and Kimi Raikkonen. Yeah, and that virtual safety car that was caused by Max Verstappen, Bastard. that that basically gave Nico Rosberg a cheap pit stop, mm -hmm. was what kind of made, you know, it turned the happenings of what would have been a great race, maybe possibly, who knows, we'll never know, mm -hmm. into a race that would have fit more in last year's calendar 
But All I right. get yeah. yeah yeah that <laughs> you know what I mean that actually makes a lot of fucking sense. But, How many headlines did that guy make this weekend though? Who? Like half of them, Max Verstappen. Right? Yeah. Oh well, Jesus guy. Driver of I the did, day. I'm not here. I'm not here. I'm, I'm not, not here, here to, to finish, finish fourth. fourth. Oh, sorry, you finished last then. Like it's, just not, <laughs> it's not like you're gonna finish anything better than fourth though. Yeah. <laughs> what, what happened to him? Like something in the engine? No, he's fucked up, man. He's okay. So he showed up yet again. Okay, so we, we, we said this <laughs> earlier in the year. Um, and you remember in Australia when everybody was saying, like, well, you know, he kept fucking around and, like, he was behaving like he's a child. He's still too young. Yeah, it's, people are saying, like, oh, okay, now he's showing his age, right? I think you can say that this is, you know, we, we right, said that, right. that was, like, the yeah, buzzword. Yeah. He's showing his age yeah. uh, in Australia. I wish I was still a teenager, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, he was saying, I'm, Max, get out of the way. No! Uh, you know, <laughs> right? Like, that's... <laughs> Why is this no! guy? This is a fucking joke. <laughs> so he said that over the radio, right? Yeah. But now with with he kind of did something again that it, <laughs> that to some people he's shown his age because right. he got all this combobby. Like it's like he was he had the raise and he thought he had it or whatever, and then he got that mistaken radio call. Right. That was supposed to be for Ricardo, but it didn't make sense for him anyway. Yeah. Uh, and then he fucked up that pit st- that pit stop. He, and fu- he fucked up the pit stop? Well, he fucked up the he- pit stop. And not only did he fuck it up, is that the drivers, they all have a button mm. in the steering wheel that PC. says pit confirm. PC button. They're supposed okay. to just just so that things like this, like what happened to him, mm. don't happen. This is built in. Whenever they, they get the call or like somebody like, you know, whenever he's going into the pits, he's supposed to press that so that everybody in the garage knows to be ready. And he didn't do this. Danny, if is this not one of the most basic things? Yeah, well, as far as modern F1 goes, yeah. You press that button, yeah, and a big sign comes up that says, con- con- pit confirmed, yeah. the driver's coming in. But yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's a big thing, because especially this season, it's a, or this, uh, this formula, I guess, is more of a strategy formula. Yeah. You have to structure your pit stops before the race starts, and then change them when stuff happens, like... Well, Max Verstappen stopped on the track and caused the virtual safety car. Talk about that in a second. Mm. But you have like your your drivers before the race. Like you're going to come in on this lap. You're going to come in on this lap. And then you structure your race around that. But he, he just kind of came in off the cuff. He thought that he heard that he had a pit stop. He pulled in. The mechanics weren't ready. Nothing was ready. So kind of screwed up his own race. So he went in, right? And because the, there was only like tire blankets yeah. in the way, he like couldn't pull up all the way to um, uh, to his spot. Then they moved it out of the way. And like he went a bit further, right? You remember that? Yeah, that and dr- then, there was a drill in the way. He couldn't just drive over it. Right. Um, when Not he with did, that attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Not when, with that rake. Apparently when he did that, or like that's some of the speculation, is that when he like just switch into first and had to do like a quick like to like move it forward that could have contributed oh, to I the mechanical problems later on he it might have like he might have put undue stress or at least stress that these cars are not expected to withstand hmm. right like the cars are not supposed to like be like sitting in traffic like on a red light you know so, as, as far as the news that i saw in red i didn't see that uh that with theory i guess but during the broadcast during the race brundo was saying like oh that sounds like a transmission sound that sounds like a transmission problem just yeah. from his massive experience yeah mm-hmm. that's what he was saying on the broadcast so i guess he was right that's what happened well this is um uh, actually I, I i saw that at the um, mark hughes from motorsport magazine said that oh, okay. it was a, a, a transmission. yeah so i just say I, I hadn't read that but it, it seemed for those who believe in uh, the balance of the universe type of whatever, this might have been some sort of karma for his uh, his behavior in Japan, I guess. Saying, you know, they made a new rule about him. Yeah. That's, there's been in the past 15, 16 years now, two rules maybe made about driving. Like you can't, you can, they made that new rule a couple of years ago about only one direction change for defending. And now it was... Before an unwritten rule, apparent according to Brundle again for the t- past 15, 20 years, not according Changing to Johnny fashion. Herbert. Yeah. <laughs> you saw them arguing on the on the broadcast on the weekend. Yeah. Oh, you foamed over. I foamed over. Damn. Mike spilled some beer. It was so close. Uh, 
they put it in the rule book now that yeah. you don't change direction under braking, mm-hmm. which uh, Verstappen was saying. It's hard to not really agree with him when you think about it. He's saying, you know, like at the end of the day, this rule is not going to change my driving style. Like these old guys need to get used to the new style of racing. They're, they're, they're just going to keep getting well, mad because they can't pass me. That's listen, his logic, they're mad because they can't pass me. His logic <laughs> was... Said. Okay, no, he th- said that. that, that they, is, hate, they hate us because they ain't us. Yeah, they hate <laughs> us because they ain't us. Um, He's right, thing, though. He said that. Uh, well, he, he, he did say that, but yeah. uh, you know, it, it sounded a bit petulant or whatever when he said it. But what, another thing that, right. that, I, that I think that he did... Like, got to work on his tone for sure. ...was maybe on point was mm-hmm. when he said that, listen... Driving like this is what got me into F1. Yeah. So why would, why, yeah, why would I stop that? Yeah. Like that. You know, He's been saying that all season. Yeah. yeah. That, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. That makes sense now, too. Both. Yeah. For uh, sure. Vince, uh, right now on the chat uh, that we have, uh, he basically said that. Uh, well, he, he just mentioned that, um, that from the start, maybe Max wasn't happy with the race. Uh, that he was supposed to pass Rosberg, that was on harder tires, uh, but couldn't, and then. He basically was told by the team to hold off and conserve the tires, and then he then 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 he was like, "No, I can't conserve the tires." The and car was that, stuck in first, like the first well, stopping car. Well, it, yeah. but it also yeah. seems that apparently uh, Daniel Ricciardo is at least he does have that advantage, uh, and and especially on tracks like this that, that have different like vastly different sectors with his accent. Uh, well, with his accent and with of his shoes. <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, but managing the tires. So my, so yeah, I, I, yeah, I, sure, yeah. I, that's pure. Tire management, uh, it seems like Ricciardo is better. And there's a bunch of headlines. Like, it was so noticeable this weekend. Like, he showed that so well that there were a couple headlines about that. That <laughs> Danny Rick is clearly, he, he was quicker and his tires lasted longer. Yeah. And he knows how to make accents. <laughs> <laughs> but a couple weeks a couple weeks back, he would look like, like Max was, like, beating his ass a few times. He looked a bit worried. Like, oh, my God. Like, ah. Oh. I'd be, no, I'd be, yeah. I, was be I was beating Vettel, but now Max is beating me. Yeah. <laughs> Sounded a bit almost like Palmer. V- Max Verstappen is probably gotten to a point now where, be- because of, of yeah, the, the, those you know, the circumstances that he got into, uh, first of all, that the top team, Red Bull, mm-hmm. winning the race, you know, being basically at the top of the F1 world for a while. Yeah. Um, you can't help that when, when you get to that position and being so young and not having that much of an experience like everybody thought like you know everybody like praised him how how mature he was coming in yeah. how like he handled the media and, and all that pressure yeah but now it's apparently like gotten to a point where during the pre or during the driver's briefing or whatever like a couple races back everybody was like max max oh why what max did what what's going on why 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 is he so so he's getting pressure from inside the paddock just outside the paddock, inside, like you know, from from his mm-hmm. colleagues, from from the other drivers. At that point, I think, and I, and and obviously, this is all you know. There's no way to prove this or not, but to me, Max Verstappen was just affected by that. It's, it's finally we finally seen like a chink in his armor. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He's 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 letting that or let that get to him. Maybe because it was like all the media could talk about, but. Uh, just like Vince says, maybe he maybe he learned from that, and maybe he will. Like that's just something that if you're gonna if you're gonna go into F one and make a stir the way that he did, mm-hmm. you're gonna you're gonna piss some people off. Mm-hmm. That's there's no way to go around that. Both. Ways. I think it's th- th- this is my weird speculation on it. I think it has to do with this right here. Yeah, mm-hmm. look at that man. Look how close yeah. that is. That yeah. close. Like, being how young he is. Yeah. Really makes me think it's like yo, if he can beat Kimi Raikkonen and Sebastian Vettel fucking veterans yeah man that says a lot and like as a young guy being able to beat his heroes essentially if he could do it that would i think that his is he's not gonna beat danny rick not by the end of the season well, just i mean maybe simply, maybe. simply by but, simply by virtue that danny rick had the the, the, fu- top the car, full season yeah, in, yeah, the, yeah. in the full in the full car like if yeah. you scroll down see where the two toro russells are located 12th and 14th mm. so you know what I mean? He did almost half the season in in the the shittier car of yep. of, of their yep. team, con- the conglomerated team. Look where he is, man! It's amazing. Yeah, it's brilliant what he's he's come to do. Listen, he's he's a fun guy to joke around with because yeah, he's 
he really is like he seems like that serious like about racing you can tell like he is yeah. serious that's what he's doing mm -hmm. but he he jokes around with himself like he's we, two, when we started this podcast we, he was already racing yeah and we were joking around like oh my god like you can tell this guy's 17 and mm -hmm. whatever whatever when i was 17 18 i was just trying to get through geography class <laughs> yeah. one's lunch break and my free yeah. period like and like when, when am i gonna jerk off <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like i gotta figure out gotta time <laughs> that shit in man man the inter like internet porn back then was just in, in its infancy oh, oh my goodness oh my God. <laughs> the kids sure these days don't know how good they got it <laughs> i'm certain he could he could bluetooth tether his phone to that screen on the dashboard <laughs> Things could Boom. things could happen while he's <laughs> But no man, the, the the maturity that he's like god damn. He's, he's, yeah, I was like he's, playing Warcraft. He's kicking I, ass now. I think I think it's a bunch of haters. Yeah. I'm sorry, about Warcraft? No, no. no it was no. a futile point. Um <laughs> Uh, I, okay, let's let's do this one thing because I know that like we've been asked to do this and people have been like calling us uh, out for not to do, to not to do this. So let's what? at least what? What? for the next ten minutes let's talk about the race and the weekend and let's mm -hmm. try. That's like, what we've been doing. Do, 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 do. No, no, but like you know we're only on Verstappen so far. Beginning to end or whatever, like team by team analysis. Are we doing that? Is that what we're doing? Uh, okay, let's talk about. Right, let's uh, do it. Okay, I got a point. Yeah. Uh, so finally. Mm -hmm. um, um, Hamilton got a good start. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that, right? Hey! Because that, that was oh, the link. There oh, you right. go. Yeah, he did. He did. He finally got a good start. He got a and good start and a good qualifying. Sky uh, was yeah, that's right. I was following the qualifying online, but yeah. I, I didn't get a chance to watch it. He was be like he no contest, no contest. He, yeah, he we, broke it the yeah. lap record Man, no, it, into the, the one thirty four. The fastest rap lap. <laughs> Ah, the words. The rap record. The, the rap record. <laughs> the lap record. Yeah, the, the fastest lap ever recorded in the in the in, in for this Grand Prix. Uh, obviously, the, 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 the Grand Prix hasn't been around for that long, <laughs> but he's got an. Uh, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, this is the only track that you can now categorically say that Lewis Hamilton loves. So when you when you when you hear that in the media, oh Lewis, they they say that about every track, but this one statistically, yeah, yeah he really like yeah. <laughs> he's won his track. He's won it uh, four out of five times that it's happened yeah. ever. He's got the lap record. He's got the, he, it's he, not just like, the Sky Boys yeah, being yeah. like, no, 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 Lewis Hampton yeah. loves this man. No, no, that's, so you can't that just one... pick and choose the stuff you like about Lewis. <laughs> But Lewis has been doing a fantastic job yeah. for Formula One, frankly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Lewis just loves this track. Oh, my God. Uh, but, yeah. But Hamilton and Rosberg, one, two. Whatever, whatever. Ricciardo, though. Ricciardo. Right He's up there, man. Solid form. So, second half of the year. And, and now let's Red Bull's got their arrow in form. So, Magnussen and form. Palmer down here. And I, and I think that Magnussen is a guy. Not necessarily Palmer, but Palmer is right there still. He's a guy that, um, like, he's no, he's no, obviously, he's no Alonso or anything like that, mm -hmm. but he's a guy that would extract, like, I guess, the average performance of, of, of the car that he's at. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, right. you put, you put him in a car and he's a competent enough driver. He, he's proven that he, uh, when he was in McLaren or whatever, mm -hmm. that, like, he could take his car to where the car is supposed to be. Like you see, you right. see here, like, mm -hmm. right. Like, so Magnuson, I, I'd say, I think is a good indication of where Renault, the team Renault should, should be. be sitting. Yeah. If you're an average driver, um, and they have the same engine as Ricciardo all the way up here. Right. Right. So clearly this is Red Bull. That's it a tag horror, though. They have watch parts in there. <laughs> <laughs> From the 1800s. They, used to, they built it by hand. <laughs> Precision. Bite the table to like, line them up. Uh, no, but it, it's the same engine, right? Yeah, he put his teeth, in, <laughs> yeah. his uh, teeth on the table. <laughs> uh, same engine. So clearly, Ricciardo being up here and, and Verstappen, we've seen them very competitive the mm -hmm. second half of the year, is straight down to the magnificent aero program that Red Bull runs and that's yeah. always been their strength. They've they're they're the right. aero guys and they're there because the car is just that good at being a, an aerodynamic machine and like mm -hmm. managing all 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 the you know the turbulent air and all the all the downforce and you know applying the most downforce. I remember uh, seeing yeah. a, a gif on the Reddit uh, about <laughs> uh 
it was the, the gif was or it was some sort of streamable but essentially it was like a, a red bull or it might, might have been a toro rosso now mm -hmm. that i think about it but they were coming in actually i think it was max uh he's coming in with all like the that grill attached yeah, yeah, to the front to i i'm guessing to to uh, measure the air force yeah measure the measure the air force so yeah, it's they, an array of pitot tubes. Array of pitot tubes. The pitot tubes. Pitot tubes. Pitot? Yeah. The pitot pitot. Tubes. You see them like on the front of the F1 cars. You see yeah. them on the front of airplanes. And they measure the air that's coming into. It's like mm -hmm. a really small hole. Okay. And they, they measure the pressure of the air that's coming in there. And you can figure out your air speed. Airplanes oh. have them on the front. The F1 cars, you see them on the... On the nose, usually they're standing up. Oh, is that up. that stupid thing in the middle? Yeah, one of them will be the antenna. That's like the radio antenna the, okay. for the talking. One's the data antenna. One is the pitot tubes. They have a couple oh. of those. But they'll put like a whole array for the during the practices. They'll put those square arrays on the side of the car mm. in a grid, and then you you see with that they have maybe 20, 30, 40 pitot right. tubes. And you can get an idea of the air that's coming off the front wing and over over the nose past Gosh. the driver. Oh, that's so that's so. And great. you you yeah you see like where the the high pressure is and the low pressure and mm -hmm. see how there's, their their wing is working. There's a certain art to it. To see if their cat is working. The, the thing is that you know how like it, that grill that holds them in yeah. place. The fact that that grill is there, there that must affects it the must, airflow. It must, right? Yeah. So it's it's you got to be a, a smart engineer to figure out. It's like, one of what? those quantum things too. It's like you know, as soon, <laughs> yeah. as, you, as soon as you measure it, like <laughs> measuring is the fucked up thing about it. Yeah, you can, <laughs> yeah. You can, yeah, you can sort of measure the air in the front half of the car really with those. Mm. But then after that, it's it's useless data. Useless. Yeah. yeah. Now here's one thing though, and going back to Danny Rick. Yeah. Um, Danny, like, did he? Does he contracted any terrible diseases or viruses well, no, he, from drinking out of all his racing shoes? Uh, you know, he, he, it's it's more of a convoluted argument, but uh, Red Bull kills ger all germs. Everything that I that we've seen, right? Like, like, there's been like a recent like flux of articles saying that Alonso's is shit, right? I heard that Re Red Bull kills the Zika virus. <laughs> it's the cure. Um, is that why we're drinking it? Yeah, that's what it, is. <laughs> it keeps your head from shrinking. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what <laughs> one can that's the cure um but but you know like you've seen it there's some people that like have been saying oh you know alonso like he's still like the yardstick he's still like the standard he's right? number five man no, 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 he's one of one of yeah. five drivers who didn't get lapped this weekend he did a he did a great job at this grand prix right like oh, that oh, battle in the end is. of the race yeah. ah, that was amazing oh, yeah. every... <laughs> that was amazing yeah so Speechless. Alonso is, you know, but by, by the people that know the sport by now, and, mm -hmm. and the people that like are really into it, they've all been like praising Alonso. Uh, on on Reddit, he's like, there's two threads right now, uh, making the front page of, of the F1 Reddit. Um, one saying that Alonso right now has more points in, in the McLaren Honda than Massa in the Williams Mercedes. <laughs> right. Uh, and check this and, out. McLe and and just. And he uh, also apparently like, then somebody like made uh, an analysis of like his career so far, and nobody has beaten Alonso over a season or overall uh, in terms of his teammates. Nobody's even matched him over their times as teammates. However, two have matched him over over a season, uh, truly and button. But anyway, like so he's he's a big deal, and he demonstrated all of like his driving might then, and now when he was asked. Like, who does he think is the most complete driver or whatever, like the most impressive driver? He this said weekend? Ricciardo. This weekend no, no, he was like, asked? Like right now in, in, in Formula One now, he said Ricciardo. This weekend he said that? Like he said that like within the last few days. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I kind of I, I agree, man. He's got, he's, he's the closest now to the Hamilton of being like the social media star, the... Uh, he's jo always joking around. He hasn't busted he's, out his phone in any press conferences. He's so likable, like, but he's, he's beat. He's been on fault. <laughs> how many podiums has he been on since the summer break? A bunch. Mm. He's kicking his teammates' ass. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing. What I was gonna say about Alonso is that McLaren Honda, mostly because of Alonso, is beating Toro Rosso, Haas, Renault, MRT, 
the Mercedes, the uh, and yeah, they, and they really picked in up. Points. They and Sauber really in picked up. Well, the car they're, they're in sixth place behind Williams. Clearly, oh they've God. they've worked out some of their engine kings, yeah. and apparently their chassis wasn't as good as they said it was at the beginning. So they've worked on that as well. Uh, like they're okay. apparently one of the one of the only teams that's still bringing like new parts every single weekend um. and, and and testing and testing. But still, look at it, like that fifth spoke for itself, and that yeah, and, yeah man. And, and remember, I lost for it too. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And he, you could tell that like he's a great driver because he loves it. Like, yeah. it, like he. Yeah. The stewards loved it. They his, didn't give him any penalty. He his, popped Massa's tire. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, no, he's fine. Williams was co- Williams' official complaint was that Alonso used Massa's car as a brake. <laughs> they, he used touching the four wheels together as a brake to slow mm-hmm. himself down, and that. Was <laughs> yeah. ah. he, did he, but he finished he, at the yeah. like his last radio transmission over the, the, the was broadcast on the race was in good. Yeehaw! He loved it. He yeah. loved every single of it, and we yeah. loved watching him. And yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. That's that's one of the things that like, he'll be back next season. Oh yeah, yeah. He's, he's, it, it's if, gonna if McLaren keeps going in the direction that they're going. He, they might actually like look man they might actually start challenging for some wins mm-hmm. next year yeah i think i think they're finally confident they started a year late so like yeah they didn't bother advertising themselves everybody yeah. knew and they said you know we've got a challenge ahead of us we're, beh- mm-hmm. we're a year behind we've we mentioned a couple of weeks ago they hired they announced to the public that they hired a whole sec separate team to work on a second the next generation of the motor at the same time that they're working on this one, yeah, they're super committed, and we we just saw somebody posted on Reddit a link that it, some some kind of Honda historical eight millimeter footage that's being dropped in, all in Japanese. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Honda's putting out some that historical like look at our racing heritage. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna watch that. T- I'm gonna throw that on tonight when I make while I'm making dinner in the that's- background. It's it's so again we, the, the, it's exciting and you can feel it. Honda is coming back. So again, we we've successfully strayed out of like what we meant to do, which was cover the race. No, but no, we're not no, no, I I love it. One team thing to team. say about about about, about Honda just that exciting. To, yeah, no, no, whatever. So to to go in with that like Honda excitement, like Honda is a team that if if people like just look back and at back to two thousand and four two thousand and six whatever with where the Honda team was back then and like now coming back to f one uh, as a as a as a manufa- as a just an engine manufacturer you'd be forgiven for thinking that Honda is in on it or whatever and has like the same kind of history in f one that say Renault has for example but no Honda has Honda's a bigger huge. history Honda, Honda since has, the 1960s yeah Honda was there and they were um crucial back then and and very historically important back then because they were basically the first fully uh, funded team that came from outside of europe nobody was nobody from outside of europe was like even dared to open a team and in that sense they were trailblazers and they showed the rest of the world that it could be done and that it, they could be competitive and that they could race in formula one and in a way a lot of success that f1 has had globally via via its success in japan has been due to Honda. So Honda is great for F1 and I'm and glad that this this to me means that they're actually fully committed. I know that we've said it before and they've said it, but this is great. It's great to see that they that they're really like going for it. Honda showed like all of Asia that we can build cars too. Like North yeah. America was and the Europe where the I guess Europe started, the original hub of autos, then America, then then Asia. Almost half the cars in the world are made in Asia now. Mm-hmm. There's 15 manufacturers coming out of there, yep. and so if continuing with the uh, the Austin Austin news, yeah. I think it was on the Ted's qualifying notebook, but it might have been the race notebook. When he was talking about speaking with Monisha Kaltenborn at Sauber, and her telling him that sauber for next year was going to be sticking with the 2016 ferrari engine because you know they were afraid that perhaps ferrari might move some of the pickup points like mm. the the which for the people that don't know it's that's that's the places on the engine where the strength is where you bolt it to your <laughs> chassis mm. so like your engine be and the chassis become one those are the spots you bolt them in 
that was her answer and he was saying you know that sounds kind of strange like that's a kind of a weird reason but maybe they want to just focus on their their arrow for next year and uh it's Maybe they, perhaps they shook hands on a, a deal for maybe some some leftover engines and stuff for next year, but so you so want to say something? Some, some <laughs> Vince on on the chat, he he just dropped something savage. He was like, "So Honda was the first team from outside of Europe. What about all those British teams?" <laughs> 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 Hashtag Brexit. <laughs> Oh, shit. <laughs> Savage. <laughs> anyway, go on. Sorry. Okay, yeah. So, so Manisha called him born, you know, she said, oh, you know, you know. And then Ted was, Ted was thinking, you know, maybe, you know. She was being a politician and I'm getting tired of how all these people lying through their teeth. She could have just said, we don't have the money, man. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, th I think you missed the next part of the story, which I, th I believe came out this morning, is that so yeah, they they sort of they sort of intimated that they'll probably be focusing on the aero next year. They don't want to change the pickup points. The new engine might be too much for them to focus on, even with the new sponsors as a small team to mm -hmm. cover a new engine and some an aero package and chassis, which is bolted new tires to it and everything next year. Yeah. But it's looking like 2018 is going to be Honda powered Sauber. Oh yeah, and they're just you have to look long term. Obviously, this. Yeah. In, in the world of F1, you look long term. 2017, I think I'm going to say it right now, it's a throwaway year for Sauber. They're just going to throw it away, focus on the aero, and come back with the most badass, savage aero package they can muster out of a whole season of 2017 with an old ass engine, not giving a shit about where it's bolted to the chassis. Right. But coming back in 2018 with a totally redesigned zero token badass honda engine which obviously can compete now we're at the end of 2016 mm -hmm. they've they've caught up alonso's in fifth place yeah uh that was a sorry long, that yeah, was a yeah. long, i'm gonna raise my hand when i have something long I, I, I want to bring up what's and, up mike and, and we i i don't want to like get out of austin oh, whatever man it doesn't matter we uh, already, this is a salad already <laughs> it's it's a salad already yeah. so like we and i it's a question i kind of want to bring up yeah. to uh nicholas when we interviewed him but never got the chance or never came up but like, 2017 is going to be a very, very, very interesting year. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be so, like, and I'm curious to think what you guys think about it, um, in terms of like how the grid is going to look. Maybe like halfway through the season, or maybe this time next year. Like, what is what is this going what is this going to look like? Like, is it going to be closer, or is it going to, or is someone going to pull ahead? Is it probably going to be Mercedes at the top again? We'll pull up this one again. I think there are still as many as eight of the twenty-two seats are not confirmed can for you, next can season. You sc like scroll out or whatever, like make it smaller. Am I wrong? Okay. Am I wrong? What, what's your estimate? Eight about eight of these seats are not. Jesus Christ, man! Not no. solid for okay, next let's, year. Let's just go like from the top of the list down and like top, from like, the top. So. Nico Rosberg confirmed for yep. next year. Lewis Hamilton, Lewis Hamilton confirmed, confirmed. Both of them. So, Danny so Rick. Mercedes is down. Yes. Danny Rick, yes. He Two Ferraris, yes. Two Ferraris, yes. Max, Max Verstappen, Verstappen yes. yes. Sergio Perez, yes. Yep, he's staying where he is. Valtteri Bottas, Bottas yes. yes. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting. Yeah. Nico, Nico Hulkenberg, no. he's moving Renault. to Renault. Mm -hmm. okay. That seat is open. So this seat, One the, second, India seat. The, the Force India seat. Uh, the Brazilian press says Nazar is confirmed there. Now, this is very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Select countries in the world press, the world press behemoth say no. that. You know who's saying that, apparently? According, well, this is according to Joe Sayward. The media but, company is owned by his family? No, 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 no. <laughs> it is. I wouldn't be surprised. Bernie. It's, mm. it, this is apparently now. That seat is important because it is a power struggle, and, and it, 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 this is a, a a brilliant. And I <laughs> love him or hate him, uh, Joe, Joe Sayward is just the only guy out there that's talking about this like shady. He goes like, left, he goes right, he goes underground. <laughs> yeah, he, and, he he's not always he's, he hasn't always been right, you know. Um, but he checks every single corner for the story. Yeah, he, and, he, and he's he's the one that's snooping there for like the the, the real controversial backroom yeah. dealing stuff. Like he's pointing at people and like calling them out. So the second Force India uh, seat right now 
is a power struggle and here is why um sauber doesn't have a lot of money and mm-hmm. like you like you rightly pointed out like next year's it, it could be a throwaway year so the good money is not going to be with them right like, as much as they might not want to pay drivers a lot of money they also won't have a lot of drivers that are going to want to drive with them next year necessarily the federal right? government of india wants to throw vj malia in jail yeah now, yeah <laughs> that's, exactly that's, and that, that's a small problem and that's the other thing <laughs> no, no, uh, so i was talking about sauber but now force india right. is a team that probably does have a future despite vj malia vj malia <laughs> <laughs> vj malia also is looking to sell his shares and this is known because he he's running out of money he's gonna anyway whatever his, he's his problems whatever he's we've, we've talked in depth about his problems if anyone knows where he is you can email us at so now show up flat out fever.com this second <laughs> um uh for cindy's seat <clears throat> bernie apparently on one side is gunning and that's why he's pushing that story it's apparently coming from bernie and bernie's like far-reaching tentacles in the, in the people in the media that he has in his pocket. Yeah, it, they're pushing the story that uh, Force India needs Philippe Nasser. But the only reason He's anybody... He's a cool guy, man. The only reason that anybody would need Philippe Nasser at this point is <laughs> because F1 right now, is at the end of this year, is going to lose... Philippe Massa? Philippe and Massa. nobody will be confused anymore? Yeah. <laughs> but at least the Brits who can't pronounce those two names but Matt, beside each other. If you're a thinking team, you won't necessarily go for Felipe Nasser because, as call it what you will, but he hasn't really impressed. He's had every single chance to beat Ericsson, and he hasn't been. And now Ericsson is, is a, his teammate. Ericsson is, is interesting because there's going to be. To, we've mentioned he's been to the hospital quite well, a few times this but season. There's going to be Swedish money coming he into Sauber, a right? Clumsy of a, yeah. So. Felipe Nasser exiting Sauber is looking more and more likely. Mm. And if he exits Sauber and doesn't go into the Force India seat, he won't be in F1. And what Bernie's thinking, and from the commercial rights holder perspective, is that Brazil still has a huge Formula One following. There's investors still looking to invest in F1. So if you're a wheeler and dealer, like Bernie is, you'd try to keep a Brazilian driver. So he is apparently a story from like, and, and actually basically going up to the team, he's gone up to the team apparently and said, you got to take Felipe Nasser. So it's a power struggle in between mm-hmm. what Bernie's power or perceived power might be versus what the team could choose. Because apparently the team and VJ Malia would much rather put somebody else in that seat would much rather have, like any any comp any other competent driver out there. We're talking about like Magnussen. If Magnussen doesn't get the second Renault seat, uh, we're talking about any number of people that are out there that they seem to think that they might be better for a team like Force India that has a future mm. rather than Felipe Nasser. And Bernie's saying you got to keep Felipe Nasser because you got to have a Brazilian. That's to me, that's fact. But that's just. I guess how 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 like the dark quarters of F1 turn. It's political and it's a huge market. It's a badass circuit. It's one of it's very similar to the Japanese circuit in that it's one of the old school circuits. It's very narrow. There's not a lot of forgiveness. It's all grass and sand. There's no paved runoffs there. It's a serious track. What? It's a badass track. Brazil. Oh well, yeah, big. What's that? <laughs> the Ducks Bill. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jose Carlos Pache, uh, Bico de Ga- Bico de Bato. But that's, that's the name of one of the a complex of corners that literally looks like a duck. So they call it <laughs> the Ducks Bill. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the market there is incredibly large, partly because of Senna, because of their sports culture though, that's just built into the country. They're just what athletic, is- athletic people. They love F one. What They've these had the stupid race there forever. Old people need to understand is that they're ignoring every they're ignoring everything else around them and to realize that first they need to work on fixing the shit that's wrong with F1 and then figure out about about like you know where the audiences are going to come from because I guarantee you that the Brazilians <laughs> will still tune in. The Brazilians that are hardcore fans and like the, the you know the big 
fanhood that F1 has in Brazil is not going to go away just because they don't have a driver in one year. They can, I, I assure you, Formula 1 can go without a Brazilian driver for a year. And maybe, you know what? And maybe they'll just come up with a different Brazilian driver that's much better in a couple of years' time. And why not? Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure, like, he's not one of the guys that follow as closely. I'm not sure mm-hmm. on his, like, his social media game. Mm-hmm. Is he is he posting a bunch of stuff in Portuguese Huda. for the Brazilians? Who, Felipe Nasser? Nasser, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> he should be. Like, him or his team, if he's got a team, like, they should be pushing, man. Like, he's the next. Massa's gone. He's the next dude to represent. Brazil, right, yeah. For Brazil, yeah. Like, that, that Brazil should be pushing him as that. You know what I mean? But, anyway. But back to. He's not very active. Yeah, back, 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 back. So yeah, so back, back, back to this list. Back to the list. So we have that very interesting Force India uh, seat that could be occupied by either Felipe Nasser if Bernie gets his way. Sergio or... Perez is calling for the fastest guy available. No, apparently that they want. They could, they could be. It could be even like anybody down, right down to uh, Verline or Ocon even. Perez said though he wants the fastest guy that's available. Who's who? So who's the fastest out of those two? Who, who would you put your, bu- your 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 buck? Verlaine or Ocon? Mm, I don't know. I have an opinion. I'd, on I'd this. say Verlaine. Oh shit! Yeah, well, I, more, I, I was gonna say I have an opinion in this, and it's Verlaine. Say, <laughs> I was gonna say Verlaine because well, we're allowed to have the same opinion. Yeah, obviously, <laughs> that, that, that that leans towards it being probably the probably the the real answer because. You know, he, there was a whole controversy this weekend. The team told him to turn his engine off, and he didn't, and he <laughs> felt bad about it. And he's like, you know, next time they, they tell me, maybe I will turn it off faster. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll happen. That shit will happen. Um. So, yeah, so 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 then this seat becomes interesting because of that. But, and, and, but then outside of those two... Everybody that's gunning for this seat is mm-hmm. also gunning for the second Renault seat. Right, uh, Nico. Nico seat. I was one thing I wanted to ask Lat- Latifi. I didn't get to mm-hmm. was you know like all these drivers around the paddock at least like you know GP is obviously GP two is not as publicized as F one. You don't see. Yeah, well, it's on TV if you look for it, but it's not like in your face. Mm-hmm. But all these drivers sort of have like uh, names like K Mag, the Ham. Whatever. So, what's his name? Like the people call him around the paddock, Nicholas, Nick, Nicky Lats. <laughs> you know, there's already two Nicos yep. in F1. Nico. He could be maybe Nico, Nico. When if he got up there. It, it, where were you? Where are you going with this? That's it. That's <laughs> that's as far as that's as far as I thought I had. He can't be Nico for sure. Um, Nicky. I like Nicky Lats anyway. Then okay. Alonso. Al- Alonso. Not going anywhere. Yeah, not going anywhere. Felipe Massa. So he's well, going straight to the bottom. So the second, the second started from the bottom. Now I'm still here. The second Williams. That's his son. Uh, is going to go to Lance Stroll. It yeah. hasn't been announced, but there's no point arguing whether anybody else will go in here yeah. because everybody knows that it's going to be Lance Stroll. Uh, Stroll, yes, he's going to go to Williams. Cool, move on. Mas is going to be his personal coach <laughs> or something, right? Carlos Sainz got renewed, right? Yeah, he's he's yeah. in. Roman is in uh, yeah. in the house. Yeah. Daniel Kvyat miraculously got yeah, resigned. He's, he's got resigned. <laughs> yeah. That I just did not understand. <laughs> well, his recent performance shows that like he he has something in him that you can wake up. Right. So if they saw and can not stop him from being an asshole. Yeah, with the guys. He, he's a you know dick. What? I think I think he was a dick for a couple of weeks. I think maybe we just don't understand it. Right. In the same reason that some people call Alonso an asshole. I, I, I no. Just, no, 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 no. You okay. can't. You of all people can't make that <laughs> no, connection. No, no, but okay. So uh, watching the so just anecdote now. Mm. Uh, in Montreal, when we, uh, one of the I think it was the second year that we went to Montreal, and anyway, we found that that nook turns uh, turns six and seven for the race. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that milk is sick, right? Uh, so we, we were How on that. How secret is that patio, though? So, yeah, that was the best. <laughs> uh, so um, we were there, and we noticed that there's these guys that show up every single year, and they were clearly massive fans. I don't know if we're going to see them next year, because they were clearly, like, Brazilian massive yeah. fans and show up to Montreal. And um, the second year we were there, whatever, like, I was just screaming, like, Alonso, Alonso, every time that he went by. And one of, like, like a big guy, like, turned around and was like, 
what the fuck, man? Why, like, you know, and I was like, dude, like, he's, he is the best driver on the grid by far. And then, he, <laughs> and then he says something to the tune of, like, that may be so, but he's an asshole. And I was like, no, he's just Spanish. You don't get it. Right. <laughs> and, and and I think that maybe we just don't get it. Maybe it's just part mm. of being Russian. The no, Daniel not... Kvyat is just a bit a bit of a dick because the yeah. Russians, like, as far as I'm concerned, the Russians are the scariest white people. Ooh. <laughs> I I agree, but I think like I've I've been around like enough Spanish people and Spanish speaking <laughs> people that the way that Spanish and Spanish speaking people do sarcasm is in a very straight faced way. That's what Alonso's doing. Even even when he's speaking in English, whatever, but it's just the it, obviously he grew up that way. That's a that's the way he he seems I'm, like an asshole, but I I laugh cuz I get it. I'm gonna, tell, I'm gonna tell you right now. Spanish people and Spanish speaking people like to talk, like to talk a lot of shit. I, I know that. <laughs> yeah, he, he's he's always like, "Oh, you know, next year if it's fun, you know, I'll stick around." <laughs> this weekend I knew he's sticking around. <laughs> anyways, he had some he, I knew he had some fun. Um anyways, so, yeah, so, okay, so going going further down uh, now again we, we start getting Jensen. into interesting. So Jansen's seat, yeah. he's gone. Van Dorn is gonna take it. So that's that's definite. Yeah. The two Renos, they just confirmed. Uh, Nico Hulkenberg. Yeah. Who's gonna get the second one? People at this point are saying <laughs> that it's basically down to if Ocon wants it, he can basically have it. Mm. If not, they'll keep K Mag, okay. which will be. Uh, it's gotta be. It's gotta be K Mag over yeah, Palmer. So. The only thing Palmer oh, has yeah. going for him is no, his dad's a, money. Jesus I'm sorry. Christ. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm, I'm not sorry, even man. discussing whether Julian Palmer is gonna be an F1 next year because it's not. I tweeted. The, I tweeted <laughs> on not. Friday because just before the practice started, they showed Sky had a face to face quick interview with him. I was just telling you this before we started. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said. He said something like, you know, back when uh, back when uh, Kevin was racing alongside Button when they were teammates. He was keeping up. He was able to do a couple laps and 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 show his force against him. And uh, since the summer break, I've been able to do the same against Kevin. So you know, really, I'm just as good as Button or better. Is what he meant to that's say. That's what he did. Yeah, that's where he, he kind of trailed <laughs> off. But his his uh, his point was his point was implied. Yeah. And I laughed hard. I tweeted it. Other people laughed. He's he was the joke there. Yeah. yeah. He was the joke. Sorry, man. Yeah. So so J. I hope his dad buys uh, Silverstone though. Keep it Brit. Keep it British. So the second Renault seat together with the Force India seat are basically what are stalling the widest open seat. Well, but the, but they're, sure. they're, they're, those two are what's stalling the, the rest of the, the, seats, the driver development. Much. Yeah, or at least you're right. Yeah, the silly season. Because as soon as one of those two, whichever one it is, mm. the first one to define who's gonna be their second driver, then the other pieces will fall into place. Right. Um, okay. Renault is the top. I guess manufacturer team that mm-hmm. hasn't decided about their seats yet. Yeah, and that's that's the top seat that yeah. ever, there's probably four, five, six guys gathering money and gunning for. Pascal Verline here in the Manor, he's going to stay in F1. Yeah. So if he doesn't get uh, a Force India seat, he'll stay there. Pay mm-hmm. well, or maybe he'll get the second uh, Renault. Who knows? But uh, if he can't get a better seat than this, he'll just stay he's in the Manor. No way, driving yeah. that. He's gonna drive a Mercedes car. Yeah. Until yeah. he dies. Uh, uh, well, Van Dorn, look, we got him. Yeah, for, yeah. When uh, Gutierrez, he's out, man. Fuck yeah. him, honestly. Haas, <laughs> Haas went public and said they had expected. Haas went public and said they expected way more from him this season. <laughs> mm. He's been uh, the whole focus of this blue flag, uh, blue flag just, ridiculousness. Let's get, it, get, get over it, with whatever. Yeah. Like the blue flag, the blue flag you had stuff a, was funny. My my message to Stefan Gutierrez is that you have something to be proud of. Mm. You 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 wear an F one. You scored some points, and not this season, but you scored some points at one point or a point or something out there. Right. Uh, you put your thing. I think he put he he got his car out of Q three a few times. You know, he made a splash. People, people recognize him. People made like fan art about him. You know, so <laughs> I guess that's how you know when you made it. Yeah. And now it's time for him to move on to somewhere where he, uh, two things, he won't be holding off somebody with greater talent from taking that seat. Number right. one, and number two, maybe somewhere else where he can actually, you know, go back to winning ways and like competing competitively. 
GP two. I don't. I don't really. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think so far anybody's actually gone back from F one to GP two. Oh really? Not that I can think. For, of. Formula E. Uh, maybe but yeah, Formula E or some or something with sports cars. Maybe yeah. Gutierrez. Maybe he's blue colorblind. Yeah. <laughs> one in, one in ten humans is colorblind. Mm. You, most people. I'm a little colorblind. Most people don't even know it. I think most men are. I was mm. talking to somebody the other day that I know that he was like, "Yeah, I'm." Red, green, colorblind, you know. Oh, the stream but, health says it's red. Oh yeah, it is super fucking red. I don't know. I don't know. Can you see? Are you sure it's red? Are you sure it's, it's not super red? Purple or no? We've saffron, got a bunch some of sort of a oh whole lack of drop frames. So, yeah. Sorry, guys. For, yeah. uh, if you're if you're listening live, uh, I, we really apologize. Yeah, this we is... gotta figure. Mike, can you please call uh, your <laughs> ISP? Please. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um. But yeah. anyway, um, this will eventually make it to YouTube or whatever. If not, we have the backup file. Yeah. Um, so who, so who goes next? Uh, the two Sauber receipts right now. Yeah. Those uh, drivers have to know next year's a throwaway. Yeah. You the same engine, same pickup points. Focus on the aero. Work yeah. on the chassis. Build, the, rebuild get, the team now with new Swedish money, right? I mean, and yeah. knowing that we're gonna have this Honda engine. It was. In, it was a weird year for them, and it's going to be a weird like yeah. rebuilding team, like, rebuilding year for them, like, like you said, for another two years. How many times did we hear Monisha Kaltenborn talk this year? Once, twice, the whole season? Whole season. The last season and season before, when they were they were getting some competitive races, right? Yeah. They, she was talked to like every second week or third week. Mm. You know, badass woman in motorsports. Fuck. Team principal. Anyway. Um, yeah. Anyway, sorry, Tauber. So Pull second your socks so, up. Guys. So, the, so the Felipe Nasser seed. Uh, it's either he goes away and he goes to uh, to Force India, or he might not be in F one next year. Mm. Most likely. Too bad, buddy. I honestly, I, I I think he's as talented as he could as he is. Uh, there's other people out there that are probably just the same and might bring a little bit more money mm. that the team will probably like. You know, they'll probably appreciate. Rio Harianto. And then these two. <laughs> So Rio, oh uh, well, Rio is he, he's apparently like, apparently like still gunning, still keeping the dream alive that he's gonna be in F one next year. Who knows? That didn't. One thing for, is for sure, nobody is gonna give him a seat unless he shows up with a suitcase Some full of cash! money. Yeah, with a suitcase full of money I and no promises. No, he has to show up with the hard cash because the last time he showed up with a promise to pay and he didn't. Like, his, like, his whole country's yeah. government yeah. failed. So out of these two manor seats, uh, or sorry, uh, you know, Rio Harianto probably not coming to F1. Esteban Ocon, there's a lot of interest for to stay in F1. Now, let's say, uh, let's say something happens with the with the Renault seats, and um, let's say they decide that Ocon gets the, or, or let's say Bernie gets his way, mm -hmm. and Felipe Nasser goes to Force India, right? Mm -hmm. Then. Um, uh, for whatever reason, um, they they choose Kevin Magnussen at uh, at, at Renault, you know, for continuity and whatever else reason that you can have. So then, what happens? Do you think that Esteban Ocon would be happy to stay a Manor alongside Verline? Yes. Yeah, I do. Only because there's no else to go though. But <clears throat> but. <coughs> Where, when, and how, or, or where did he say? Did he show or prove that he is any better? He's got zero points for the season. Yep. He's coming late. We mm -hmm. with it, it's it feels weird to say, but like he had less money than Harry Anto promised that he had, which wasn't working. It wasn't working for him. So yeah, like why shouldn't he be be proud of that? This is one and a half season into formula one what else what else what else does he have what else and and, and that's it seriously the manor is looking i don't want to put this on top of daddy's laptop <laughs> <laughs> don't put it over the laptop yeah um there's nothing stopping manor from being way more competitive next year yeah serious so i'm saying right now honestly it could it could very well be that for the first couple of races even manor depending on Number one, how powerful their the next year's Mercedes is gonna be, and number two, how much they've been working on next year's car, and number three, how many magical parts that uh, Verline gets from Ber from Bernie, <laughs> that Bernie said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 
the, the Mercedes sprinkles on them, then yeah, then man, I think it, we could see a Manor next year. Like if you tell me right now that Manor is gonna finish second ahead or of, third last, ahead of the Saubers and ahead of uh, the Renaults for the first two races of next year, I believe you. Mm. Yeah, I believe you, one hundred percent. So okay. So we're just talking about Harry Anto, whatever, whatever his promises and all that. Something interesting. People were pissed. Like I, like I said, Max Verstappen made a lot of news this past weekend. Yeah. And the past few weekends, they made a new rule because of him. Mm-hmm. A new racing rule. But he, he won the driver of the day this past weekend. They always does now, man. 25, <laughs> according to social media analytics, 25% of the driver of the day votes came mm. from the Netherlands. Mm. He won. Mm. It stuck. He caused a virtual safety car that, yeah. you know, according to Vettel, fucked up his race, fucked up a few races. The Mercedeses got some, in air quotes, some free pit stops from the virtual safety car. People are calling for rule changes saying... You shouldn't be allowed to stop for tires during the virtual safety car because you get too much free time because everyone's driving slower. You get an extra long pit stop break between you and the car behind you. All kinds of craziness. Mm-hmm. Anyways, my, my point is 25% of the driver of the day votes came from the Netherlands. He won it. But if you go all the way back, you remember Australia? Rio Harriento was the driver of the day for that race. They took that away from him. Yeah. They took that away from him. Well, I mean, uh, now, now that you bring it up, like, so F1 Fanatic, the CO.UK uh, website, followed by many people in F1. Did so they drop the real statistics on the driver well, of the no, day? No, but before uh, F1 started to do a driver of the day, they, for, for many, many years, they had been tracking a driver of the weekend, driver of the weekend. Okay. that people went and voted on. And these, I mean, it's obviously flavored because anybody that's like checking Formula One fanatic all the time <laughs> is is like a, is a, probably is probably a British Formula speaking fanatic. English person. Well, well English the, speaking no, British I think, person. I think, I think he, I think he gets like ad- audience from all over. But either way, it's people that are into the sport that are checking this and and voting uh, on on his surveys. Right. And it has like it only matched a few times what uh, the official FOM survey said versus what he got it, it only matched and it seemed that as of recently it had it has always been max verstappen max verstappen max, for like the past five races or so the fia the the, the fia or fom official survey says max verstappen and his own survey on his website on f1 fanatic says something else or well, so actually for a couple of races it, it also they, they agreed a couple of times when when max was legitimately a great driver but then when he's not he's not and i i put on top of Verstappen, just about anybody else. He was actually my least favorite race, uh, driver that race. He he caused his own demise, as far as I'm as far as, far as I'm concerned, just by yeah. like by getting by getting flustered probably. But listen, you could you could argue that oh everybody's allowed to get flustered here and there, but you're you're competing at the top and other drivers don't get uh, uh, flustered like that that they don't press the pit confirm button so. I, I have no sympathy for that. I don't think Max Verstappen should have gotten the driver of the day. I think a suitable no. candidates would have been anyone from Lewis that did a great job controlling the race <clears throat> to Alonso in fifth that did an actual great job all around. Get out of here. Yeah. I My point is give Harry until back his driver of the day Australia. <laughs> Just give it back. <laughs> Come on, man. You know he deserved it. He won it. <laughs> He got the votes. He was the man of the weekend. Um, what are, what do, are you guys doing? The final Netherlands, for all you Netherlanders, point I have to make is, you know when some of these races, Canada likes to do it, British, British, British Grand Prix likes to do it, the Brits. America definitely likes to do it. Brazil has done it. Mexico did last year. I'm talking about... Flying military aircraft over the pit straight before the race. Okay. Apparently, those Chinooks and Apaches, that group of helicopters that flew over the over the paddock, over the over the main straight, <clears throat> that was the Netherlands Air Force. That was it Dutch Air Force? Apparently. 
Allegedly. Apparently, yeah. I I didn't I, dig no, super deep US? to get like I didn't dig super deep no, and get out like it wouldn't have been. Come on. I don't know, man. Look it up. Look it up, somebody, please. Could you post it or something? Like I didn't get a chance to look super deep, but yes. from what I saw, that was it. Oh yeah, Mike, if you could quickly. Apparently, those were Netherlands Air Force Boeing aircraft. What the fuck are you talking about, man? During the U.S. Grand Prix. This is what I read. And you say I Boeing didn't get aircraft. A ch- those are, pa- those are Apaches and Chinooks. Who made them? Who made them? Are they, bo- are they Boeing? Uh, this is what I read. I, I just I just said. I, I'm asking Mike if he could check quickly, baby. This is what I read. I'm, a, I'm sorry I'm throwing out some 50% half ass info. <laughs> I'll try to research everything that I say here, but I think those were not American helicopters. We there is, however, maybe you can play this. Me, the as, last, as the last link here. Patriotic as Americans are. As patriotic as Americans are. You, I don't think they could afford to do that. They're what? trillion. They're over a trillion dollars in debt now, aren't they? Are pretty well, close. That's not going to stop America. Them. Them. That's not going to stop. <laughs> they'll just they'll, yeah, they'll, 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 they'll just go on. Can't print. get gas for these choppers, yeah. man. They'll just print like three tons of like bills. Three, and, three tons of, of yeah. Of don't worry bills. about it. The state. <laughs> They have, a, they have a money printing machine. I'm gonna come literally. back. I'm gonna come back to this because, uh, whatever, man. I, I believe. Don't think so. I do I, I believe. Be, I don't believe it. I'm I mean, not sure I'm I, right, I, but I believe that I read this. That just seems like right yeah, out of left field. No, you, I don't know where you saw that, but I, I'd fact check I'm, that. I'm not even sure how I could fact check that. <laughs> like I'd have to like cross reference pictures and uh, yeah, I don't think so. Okay, here's an interesting fact that I did look up. Mm-hmm. The population of Austin, mm-hmm. Austin, Texas, the location of the U.S. Grand Prix. 885,000 people. Okay. That's the population sick. of Mexico City. Yes. The population of Mexico City. Mm. 8.85 million. Okay. Official number is exactly 10 times the amount of people. That's ridiculous. Yeah, that is ridiculous. <laughs> oh. How excited are you? Oh, yeah. We're, we're moving right on to the Mexican Grand Prix right we now. D- we, oh, did you have anything else to say nah, about Texas? So. No, uh, Texas? Oh, actually. Texas uh, is over. That was enough, Texas. No, no. I do have one, one thing to say. And it just... Just, just going back. Uh, Martin Brundle says something about track limits, and apparently, like he was pissed off that too many people were like passing on track limits. He's been saying that all season, and I have been agreeing with him all season. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Me too. I agree. And he apparently said that uh, at this, uh, the statistic that he pulled off that made it really poignant is that at this same track, at the U.S. Grand Prix track. They had um, a different race there. Uh, I forget which one it was. Hang on a second. Just let me look it up. Um, so whatever. It was just a different race. Uh, oh, the World Sport Car. The World Sports Car Race in Austin. It had 100 drivers in a six-hour race. And they managed to get them all to stick to within the white lines because they were tracking. They were using things like... Uh, like like weight sensor pads and stuff all over and nobody left the track and everybody had a perfectly great race and it was it was able people were able to monitor this it was enforceable and it was doable because they used the technology on hand Mm. so i guess more to the like more to the point his point was that listen a hundred a hundred cars in a six hour race you can keep track of that there's no way that you can tell me now that you cannot keep track of 20 drivers on an 100 minute race mm. no way so um in that again i agree and we've been agreeing with him forever all right now let's move to mexico move to mexico yeah let's pick up move to i'm mexico. gonna li- i'm living here in toronto i'm gonna stay <laughs> you can look for an apartment whatever <laughs> let me know how it goes <laughs> I'm not moving to Mexico. Oh, yeah, yeah, we got this. Nice. I'm, I, I'm really glad that we're doing this now. Yeah, right? So otherwise it's it just would... a lot of fun. Yeah, well, we, we couldn't. I'll just, I'll just let it play out. What's this yeah, place called a... again? Hermanos Rodriguez or something? I, I love this part the, of it. Out, I yeah, love the stadium The stadium part? section is badass. Short short track, though. I know. Yeah. I noticed by playing it. I was like, yeah. whoa, this, this seems fast compared well, to all the other ones I've played. It does seem. Back in the. So this is a, a track that was sort of re- redesigned from a, a track that was the venue of the Mexican Grand Prix yeah. back in the day, right? Like back in the 80s or whatever, like 70s, 80s. Um, and back in the day, back in those days, you did see a pattern on some of the Latin American tracks where they did seem a little shorter, like tracks in Argentina, 
uh, the previous Brazil track. They were kind of shorter mm -hmm. tracks because they were trying to do what F what basically what F1 is all is going back to trying to do again, which is to uh, bring the tracks kind of closer to the major city of of the countries. Right. Back then, it's because only the major cities could actually like hold an F1 event. Otherwise, mm -hmm. like you know, like so it, it had to be Mexico City. It had to be Buenos Aires. Uh, for F1, yeah, um, because they they're the cities that could like sustain it, but the major cities in South America could also probably not afford a big enough track, so <laughs> so it had to be it had to be little tracks, but and it worked yeah. for back then. Yeah, I think maybe this is like a bit on the on the shorter end, but mm -hmm. there's shorter tracks, and this is a fun track, yeah, and it's a fun track because of the environment and it's and the drivers seem to like it, so heck, why not? I liked it too, man. They reached over like a 176 last year, 176 kilometers an hour. Jesus. That's average. Yeah. Yeah. There, <clears throat> there was a chart. I, I don't know. I saw somebody posted it on Reddit maybe a few days ago. And it was just the average elevations of all the circuits around the world. Mm -hmm. This circuit is way up there. So many of the, of the circuits are actually near the ocean. A, mm -hmm. bunch, a bunch of them. The Mexican Grand Prix circuit is nearly one mile above sea level. Wow. 1.6 kilometers, 1.7 kilometers yeah. <laughs> above sea level. So the, the, the downforce, this is a high speed track where you wouldn't normally run a high downforce, but they run basically the Monaco package in Mexico because the air is so thin. It's like when you take an airplane off the ground. At the point you look out the window and start shitting your pants, that's that's how high this track is built. Yeah. Mexico City is built way high. Like, it's hard to picture in your head. Yeah, how, how like a mile? Something. Picture a mile from the ocean. Look up one mile. Yeah. That's where the city is. Yeah, that's where the city of Mexico is. Well, so the air is so it's thin amazing. there it's that in order to produce the same, the, the the amount of downforce needed, even though it's not a lot. Yeah, they need to use big steep wings that would otherwise create a lot of drag but because the air is so thin up there doesn't necessarily which is pretty crazy if, 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 pretty fucked if you ask me and then at the same time as using the heavy down downforce package they use the heavy cooling package as well all yeah. the brake ducts are opened wide up the the radiators and the side pods and the side pods themselves are opened wide up the, mm -hmm. the full size allowed which, as much cooling as possible which created last year a very interesting challenge and and that's what everybody was saying that it was yeah, it was it was, cool. a, it was a it was a return. yeah it was it was it was an interesting challenge from in terms of engineering but again you, you saw this uh this, this this pattern that somehow seems to emerge the first race in a track that you know that that is vastly different that like most of these drivers have never raced at it does seem to be that maybe they don't attack it full force and for for lack of a better term, last year's Mexican Grand Prix was a bit lacking. It was it was a bit boring, right? They, yeah, yeah. As an as an overall, yeah. It, it the was, race itself. It was cool to see. You know, this is a new track. It was essentially a new track, a redesigned old track. Oh, nobody was complaining in, because in that sense, it was really cool. Yeah, but nobody was complaining because the atmosphere seemed so great and the, like the fans were amazing. The track action wasn't there really. Yeah. So. I put it to you that this year we are actually going to see now some nitty gritty track action. Like they're now that they're maybe a little bit, or some of the top guys are a little bit more comfortable, know a little bit more what to expect. Yeah. Believe they're, it. More confidence. Yeah. All the data that they gathered from e last year. Exactly. And the temperatures are supposed to be the same. So it's going to be like just a nice, just a nice day to race. You know what I mean? So that's going to be good uh, for Mexico. Um, there's also uh, the the added factor that, like, on top of the drivers, like, knowing all, all, all of this, we have the championship, right? So Lewis Hamilton came to Austin knowing that he had to, like, his job from now on is to win every race, right? So he went and he did that in Austin, and that was good. And, but... Perhaps you, like you could make the argument, and again, Jesus, I don't, I, 
I am not a, a, a Nico Rosberg fan or anything, but I'm all for it, for a good championship. So I got to say that perhaps Nico Rosberg, because he knew that as far as he's concerned, all he had to do is uh, get in like three out of the next four, get into th second, and then he could afford one third place. He just needed, he, he knew that he, all he needed to do was finish second at least or yeah. finish third at least or hopefully ideally second and then let Lewis like, you know, take over. And if, and if it was going to be Lewis's race, then it was going to be Lewis's race and he needed to, he did, yeah. he maybe didn't need to push as hard. Right. So in that sense, I agree that they both kind of de they, they, they both kind of did what they had to do. Yeah. Now they're going into this last three races of the year. Things are different now these are gonna matter so that fight at the top is gonna be very interesting here and as far as they're they're both concerned this is a track that could go either way it's it's interesting how for some teams this and the last two races matter so much and for certain teams and to the same extreme they don't matter at all <laughs> and they focus on next year and some teams they can't focus on next year yet. It's just it's not it's not it's not there for them to 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 focus on. But 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 before we continue <coughs> listen to this. Since my this is actually going back to nineteen ninety five, mm -hmm. the three hundred second squadron has facilitated joint air assault training on Fort Hood, Texas for the Royal Netherlands Army Air Assault Infantry and Royal Netherlands Air Force helicopter crews to prepare for future combat deployments. Additionally, the 302nd Squadron conducts mission qualification training for the Royal Navy of LAF Apache and Chinook flight crews, only fully operational when used for helicopter license exercises. Otherwise, that was the Netherlands that was them. Air Force at the Texas race. That was them. Repping Max for steps. I'm not gonna believe it. I think I think that I think that's a stat that somebody threw in the background to say like, oh, did you know that like where these helicopters are coming from is also where like the Dutch train? They weren't Dutch people. No, this is coming from the Netherlands Royal Air Force website. Here's a yeah, picture of them flying over the uh, track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will not be <laughs> corrected. I've done my research, all right? <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, fair enough. So, um, <laughs> some badass helicopters. Uh, I will talk about it after. It's fine. Okay. The choppers? Yeah, that's fine. No, I used to have a what? Not the choppers. No. I used to have an, a model of an Apache I, when I was I a kid. It. it was pretty badass. Um, you know who won last year in Mexico? You remember? Remember? Do you remember? I remember who did the remember? fastest Formula One lap ever was Danny Rick at uh, 172 kilometers an hour, I believe. Nico Rosberg. He won from pole too. He qualified first. So this is what I'm saying. That's gonna be that's gonna be interesting to see. Qualifying is gonna be interesting. Everybody's gonna be gunning for it. Nico Rosberg is gonna be saying, "All right, well, if if that was the track that Lewis loves, this is clearly a track that the British people are gonna say Nico Rosberg loves because he's he, he didn't only qualify first last year, but he he won from from first and um." In that sense, it's going to be another race. It's going to be interesting for the championship. Mm -hmm. It's going to be another race that they're probably both, unless something crazy happens mechanically to either car, uh, they're probably going to be fighting for that first. Nico Rosberg, because he knows he can get it. And and Hamilton, because he hasn't gotten it yet. And because he needs to. Uh, further down the pack, it's going to solidify like where each car finishes in the, in the championship. So... In that sense, is a race that I'm looking forward to very much. The attendance, <clears throat> excuse me, the attendance last year was ridiculous, and all the townspeople that didn't even have tickets, yeah. lining the fences, cl like climbing on top of each other to see you over, just watch the race, just, just to be there. Two Mexican drivers on tra on track. Oh, it's, it's gonna be badass again. Absolutely, it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be really good. I don't know how many celebrities are gonna show up. Maybe not as many as Austin. Maybe Mexican celebrities. You know, they're not to be under assault. You know. No, of course there's, not. There's telenovelas down there, and they're huge. <laughs> I still think for Austin, you know, like whatever Venus Williams, that cooking guy, yeah. a couple other Olympians, Ferrari hat guy, 
Holy shit. How, how much attention did he get all weekend? <laughs> right, hat guy? From all the Redditors that were there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the only real attention. I mean, so we interviewed him when we were in Montreal. He's a nice guy. Yeah, we, we've never like, even posted that. He we spends like months. We've got that in the FOF archives. We should yeah, post that's it. That's true. We, do. Let's we do should, it. Let's do we it. should post it. This, uh, uh, sorry, what? I was going to say, well, if, what, what else you got? I got nothing. Uh, one, or, one or two little bits of track news here. Okay. So, okay, so you know how we've been, well, not us, but we've been talking about the teams that have been going back and forth about, oh, let's let's do the testing in Bahrain. We need right. to do right. the tires under the race temperatures. Yeah. Okay, let's do half the testing there. <laughs> let's do half the testing with the race temp. Let's make it an option. Some people can go to Spain if they want. Yeah. And the other teams can yeah. go to Bahrain if they want. So it seems as though teams have compromised on the compromised on the compromise of that compromise oh my God. that they will perform mid-season testing at Bahrain yeah so they're gonna go to Bahrain yeah okay they will they will race there <laughs> they will test there <laughs> but the bigger track news it's kind of hurts hurts my heart because okay, we, we mentioned before Brazil yeah. they've had some money problems yeah. as, a, as a country whole since the Olympics yeah Canada has fallen back on its promises to upgrade facilities. Yeah. Both are marginal on at best on the calendar for next year. The Malaysian Grand Prix feels like it's on the chopping block. Yeah, the the people who run the circuit have said we're probably not going to do it. Mm. They were going to decide this week, but the decision has been to postpone the decision as all F1 decisions are decided. This is kind of how it works. By postponing. But yeah, like, apology, like, I, I don't know how Jarno Zafali feels, because this was the first year on that new track, mm. and everybody is like, wow, that was cool, man. Like, you gave it, it's like a whole new perspective on mm. the same circuit. We've been racing 15 years. How's it going to mature? Let's come back next year when it's not new, but when it's in its pure form as a racetrack. Right. But it looks like it's not going to happen. Yeah, you're talking about Malaysia saying, fuck F1. Yeah, Moto G- MotoGP has basically no problem, boom, selling out the circuit like that. Mm-hmm. Like, like no problem. All the seats are gone. They barely did something like they 40, can also forty percent. They can also one. charge like twenty bucks a ticket. Let's be honest. They could try that too, but no, no, no. If, I'm saying MotoGP, like that's what they charge. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, but they they could try that for F1. But <clears throat> as far as the novelty regionally it looks like the people that might travel to look at the race etc there's three or four other races really close around southeast asia and uh, when it was new it was a novelty it was the first f1 race in southeast asia but it has not become sustainable so fingers crossed hopefully they come back but they're not they're gonna make a decision soon we might be down to there's three unconfirmed races for next year. Back no, to 18. No, no, no. Uh, uh, Malaysia is confirmed, though. I know that they're saying that, but that's that, that's just political posturing. Uh, I don't think it's beyond them to unconfirm it. That's true. Yeah, I think they, 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 could could just, they could just it. say, yeah. Yeah, they could just say. Without Pay fun. some sort of minimal penalty. Yeah. Less than they would probably lose by having the race. Yeah. I want to see it. I love that track. Yeah. I told you I was driving it last night in a video game. Yeah. <laughs> in video game land. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I said, it's not there's there, there there's no lack of excitement to come, ladies and gentlemen, for the next mm. few races. Oh yeah, we're gonna be here to talk about all of it. This it's great. Before we go, uh, again, uh, <laughs> I want to make another pledge. If you're t- if you're still <laughs> listening at this point, uh, you're clearly you clearly like what we do. You hit clearly subscribe. like just yeah. Subscribe. If you're if you if you're at one of our audio only listeners. That, that just listens to the podcast, uh, please take a minute to call to go to our Twitter, to go to our Instagram that apparently we have now, mm. and 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 to go to our crucially to our YouTube page, uh, YouTube channel, and hit subscribe, hit like. What that allows us to do is bring you guys more interviews like what we had this morning, and hopefully keep having more great content and and just be taking overall more seriously around. So when it comes to like. Uh, doing things that we do have a couple things in store like 
getting like passes to this or that, uh, you know, access to certain people and certain information. And if you think that we could do a good job at interviewing some of these people, like this is the kind of stuff that if you want to help us out, uh, please go on our uh, Twitter, anywhere in social media, like, hit subscribe. It means a lot to us and it guarantees that, uh, that we'll keep the, going on that. Just that little click. It, it helps yeah. a lot in mm -hmm. the long term. Yeah. Uh, another thing. For the people in Toronto, we will be having the, again, the the, the F1 at Betty's. It's happening this Sunday um, So uh, because of the race is live. So whenever the race is on, we're going to be there. Show up if you're anywhere near Toronto. It's a fun time. Thanks to everybody that showed up last week. And as last, we got a uh, uh, Mike. You guys are playing. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, we're playing next uh, Thursday at um, the Silver Dollar nice. downtown by College in Spadina. Nice. Uh, around uh starts at eight ends at 12 one of those nights of debauchery i'm i'm looking forward to it already yeah. i didn't go to the